America in the late 1890s was a land of high spirits and high drama. It was the age of ragtime and robber barons, of newspaper empires and Alaskan gold. Leading the country into the new century was William McKinley. The last Union soldier to serve in the White House, McKinley also knew war as president, presiding over a 100-day conflict that fueled the country's rising sense of nationalism and helped establish America as a player in the emerging new order of global politics. I have never been in doubt since I was old enough to think intelligently that I would someday be president. Like four presidents before him, McKinley was born in Ohio, where he grew up the son of an iron maker. He briefly attended Allegheny College in Pennsylvania, but illness and subsequent financial difficulties forced him to drop out before graduation. When he was 18, he volunteered to serve in the Civil War, making a name for himself the following year at Antietam, where as a commissary sergeant, he delivered meat and coffee to troops at the front. The act won him a promotion and a reputation for bravery. After the war, he studied law, joining the Ohio Bar in 1867. That same year, at a picnic, he met Ida Saxton, the daughter of a local banker. The couple married in 1871 and went on to have two daughters. Both children died at early ages, however, and their loss hastened Mrs. McKinley's physical decline. In time, she would develop epilepsy. A devoted husband, McKinley took care to look after his wife, especially once he began his political career. As Ohio governor, he'd stand in an office window every day at three and wave toward her facing hotel room. And later, after he was president, he broke with tradition by insisting she be seated beside him at state dinners. His kindly nature, combined with a remarkable memory for names and faces, served him well in politics, helping him advance from the House of Representatives, where he served for over a decade, to the Ohio State Capitol, where he was elected to two terms as governor. An ardent advocate of the protective tariff, McKinley soon became known for his ability to win over foes with a disarming comment or gesture. Such savvy also helped win him the attention of wealthy Cleveland businessman Mark Hanna, whose backing helped McKinley defeat William Jennings Bryan in the election of 1896. But once in office, McKinley had his share of detractors. Anxious to avoid war with Spain over its occupation of Cuba, he was criticized by a hawkish press and called weak by some members of his own administration. He eventually called for intervention in April of 1898, initiating a conflict that lasted only four months, but which won the United States control over Cuba, the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Guam. After the war, McKinley's administration continued to center on foreign policy. Having already annexed Hawaii, he went on to push for an open-door policy with China, and also led a bitter conflict against Filipinos unhappy with American rule. Such affairs also dominated the election of 1900, which cast the victorious McKinley and running mate Theodore Roosevelt as devout expansionists. Six months into his second term, McKinley traveled to Buffalo to speak at an international fair known as the Pan American Exposition. Greeting guests in a receiving line on the exposition grounds, he was shot twice by an unemployed anarchist named Leon Scholgaz. By some accounts, McKinley had just leaned down to give a small girl a carnation he'd removed from his buttonhole. He died eight days later, on September 14, 1901. Where our artisans have the capacity to excel, where our inventive genius has initiated many grand discoveries, and where the resources of our land are limitless. It is our province to lead in the march of human progress and not rest content with any secondary place. William McKinley.
Welcome to Canton, Ohio, the hometown and final resting place of our 25th president, William McKinley. Assassinated in 1901, shortly after the start of his second term, McKinley was honored in death by the construction of this towering memorial and gravesite. Today, we are on the memorial grounds in Canton to learn more about the life and times of Ohio's William McKinley. And we have three guests to help us today. Richard McElroy is a local historian and the author of William McKinley and Our America. You'll also hear from Sam Vassbinder, who is author of The Architectural Symbolism of the William McKinley Memorial. And later on in our program, you'll meet Jennifer Sowers, who is the curator of the McKinley Museum. Richard McElroy and I are on the grounds of the museum under a lovely pergola on a beautiful Ohio day and we'll be spending the next two and a half hours here to talk about William McKinley. Thank you for being with us. Glad to be back, Susan. In the 1896 election, William McKinley won handily on the first ballot by the Republicans, a clear favorite of his party. Why? What did they see in the man? Well, he had a good reputation as a congressman, of course, uh, and as governor. I mean, he's, he paid his dues politically, uh, so to speak. And uh, having a lot of money with the, by Mark Hanna's uh, uh, and his, Mark Hanna's lieutenants, uh, McKinley was uh, a favorite son of Ohio, of course, as well. But uh, winning the nomination at the convention wasn't a sure thing. He had to battle some political bosses, Matthew Quay and, of uh, Pennsylvania, and William Allison, and, and Reed, who was a Speaker of the House. But uh, eventually, McKinley was able to uh, impose quite an impressive victory at that convention. Tell us about his personality. Well. McKinley was a very uh, devout Christian. He was a Methodist, as was his family before him. And William McKinley uh, liked to read. As a boy in school, he worked very hard. I would not call him an intellectual, but I think uh, he was a bright boy. And I think he got high marks to please his parents and, uh, and his teachers. And he was very persistent. Uh, very confident of his abilities. As you heard in the beginning of the program, uh, the quote that he made that he believed that someday he would be President of the United States. And uh, although there was a touch of fatalism in his uh, philosophy too, and maybe we can get in that when we talk about his uh, assassination. But uh, he was a boy who enjoyed, uh, he was proficient in kite flying, ice skating, shooting marbles, the bow and arrow, he was good at that. Uh, loved to fish, although later on as an adult he wasn't a big fan of fishing, but uh, quite persistent. And uh, there's, there's one story about him, Susan, where McKinley, I think he was about nine or 10 years old, he and some boys are going to go swimming in Mosquito Creek uh, near Youngstown, Ohio. And he just happened to take along his fishing rod. And they got to the spot and the boys continued on downstream to fish, or to swim, I'm sorry. And McKinley decided, I'm not going to swim. I'm going to stay here and, and try and catch some fish. And he fished for several hours, didn't catch anything. Meanwhile, the boys downstream are hollering for McKinley to come on down and enjoy the fun. But uh, he stayed for about five hours and, and took home probably five or six fish for dinner. So he was very persistent as a boy. And single, he had a single-minded of purpose, I think, which uh, uh, characterized him. One of the important things about these live programs is involving you in the process. We'll take your questions. If you have some other facts and information to add to the program, we welcome that as well. Here's how you phone in, 202-624-1111. For those of you watching in the eastern half of the United States, if you're west of the Mississippi, here's the number to use, 202-624-1115. And we'll be taking phone calls throughout our two and a half hours this morning. We're beginning to get into the uh, very early parts of the audio and video age, really the film age. And so during this program, we'll be able to show you some very historical footage from that time period and also allow you to hear a little bit more about what some of these folks were talking about sounded like. Right now we have a bit of, of audio of William McKinley during a campaign speech and I'm going to play that for folks listening in and I want to come back and talk to you about his rhetorical style. Let's listen in. I, middle citizens, recent events have imposed upon the patriotic people of this country a responsibility and a duty greater than that of any since the Civil War. Then it was a struggle to preserve the government of the United States. Now it is a struggle to preserve the financial honor of the government. Our breed embraces an honest dollar, an unpunished national credit, 
adequate revenues for the uses of the government, protection to labor and industry, preservation of the home market, and reciprocity which will extend our foreign market. Upon this platform we stand and submit its declaration to the sober and considerate judgment of the American people. That was William McKinney, McKinley audio from uh, the first campaign and I want to talk about rhetorical style but also about the issues that he was talking about, trade, tariff, protectionism. Well, McKinley usually spoke from prepared notes. He was not a good extemporaneous speaker, often handing notes, holding the notes in one hand and, and using slight gestures in the other. Uh, somewhat of a monotone, he had a slight nasal uh, twang to his speech, but his pronunciation of the words were very good, very precise and uh, he had good command of the King's English. Uh, he once complained, though, that uh, William Jennings Bryan was uh, a better speaker than he was. In fact, McKinley made a comment, I have to think when I speak. So, uh, as far as his speaking ability goes, he was, he was a very good uh, orator. How about, how about the issues? Well, the issues in the 1896 uh, campaign, Susan, uh, were, of course, uh, very much different than, than the ones uh, today. Uh, we had an economic depression under Cleveland's administration, second administration, so we were in the throes of uh, some bad times economically. Uh, around 1893, 1894, we had about 15,000 businesses uh, go bankrupt, 150 banks failed, we had 4 million unemployed uh, workers, so the time was good for the Republican campaign uh, in uh, 1896. Uh, but we had some international problems too. You mentioned tariffs. And there was a debate, of course, in the country, should we have tariffs at all, should they be high, should they be low. McKinley, of course, favored uh, higher tariffs to uh, encourage people to buy American products. But you also had uh, uh, European nations uh, butting their noses in uh, the Central Americas and some of the uh, islands of the Pacific. You had uh, the British seeking control of Venezuela. Yeah, you had uh, uh, an insurrection in Cuba going on which threatened the American sugar interests there. So we had some problems uh, going on and, and the least, not the least of which was the annexation of Hawaii. The Queen had been dethroned there and again because of American business interests there was an issue as to whether uh, Hawaii should be annexed to uh, the country or not. First call on William McKinley comes from Charleston, South Carolina. You're on the air. Well, f 49 years ago I married the great-grandson of a chaplain and a captain in the Confederate Army. And while he was serving with Lee, McKinley, Sergeant William McKinley and Colonel Rutherford B. Hayes appeared at the door of Sarah Holroyd in Athens, West Virginia, and requested lodging for the night. She and her children invited them in. Uh, later in the evening, she said, would one of you please read from the family Bible? If my husband were here, he would do this. And they did. And the next morning, they went on their way to Beckley, where their headquarters were. Thank I didn't you. I think this speaks to this. I have a question, too. Yes. And my question is, in my Norwegian immigrant grandfather's effects in Iowa, there was a book called something like the day President McKinley was shot. Um, are you familiar with that book? I'm not familiar with that particular book, uh, but getting back to your uh, comments about uh, McKinley spending time in West Virginia, I know he spent the winter uh, in or near Beckley uh, while he was in the Civil War. I believe that was the winter of 1861 and 1862. It's also important to underscore his commanding officer was a future President of the United States. Right. The, re the relationship between Hayes and McKinley I often uh, cite as a, an example uh, uncle to a uh, nephew. Uh, but uh, yeah, Hayes was seriously wounded, as historians know, at the Battle of South Mountain in September of 1861. In fact, I, he was left for dead on the battlefield. And uh, uh, McKinley didn't see any action at South Mountain, but he did later uh, at Antietam a couple days later. Another future president with whom McKinley was friends was Garfield. Yes. Uh, James A. Garfield and William McKinley really shared a lot in common. Their backgrounds, their families, their rise in politics. Uh, both men were deeply religious. Both were lawyers. And uh, 
they, they were friends. In fact, the McKinley family, Ida and William McKinley, spent time at the Garfield White House and as well as the Hayes White House uh, uh, while McKinley was in Congress. Can you uh, tell us or speculate about what it might have been that would have brought three future presidents, first of all, together, but also what, what about this part of the country developed these men into national leaders? Well, George Nepper of the University of Akron is, uh, can tell the story better than I can. Uh, he's an eminent Ohio historian. But uh, Ohio was a good training ground for uh, greatness. I call it the crossroads of destiny. I think the, the Buckeye State, uh, all things considered, uh, the climate, the number of people who came into the country, uh, a lot of intangible things created an environment for, uh, for greatness and opportunity and success. And it's no accident that uh, we've had uh, seven Ohio presidents. Now, one of those born in Virginia, but raised in Ohio, or lived in Ohio for many years. Washington, D.C. As uh, several other presidents, McKinley had roots in Northern Ireland. When did his family emigrate from there, and what interest might he have he uh, had in Irish issues? Well, his roots were not only in uh, Northern Ireland, but also in Scotland. Uh, he had a, a grandfather who fought in the Revolutionary War, and uh, two grandfathers, his maternal and fraternal grandfathers, fought in the War of 1812. So he never got over to Scotland, but he was very proud of his heritage. And uh, you know, there are various letters and, and uh, uh, conversations that he had, family reunions. He was very proud of his Irish heritage. Uh, my book uh, happens to have pictures of uh, the McKinley uh, ancestral homes over in uh, Ireland. But uh, I, what I found interesting about McKinley and his family uh, background was their motto. And the family motto was, don't want too much. And I think that has pretty good advice in a materialistic world of today. This is Rich McElroy's book, William McKinley and Our America. It is available in this region of the country in Borders bookstores and also here at the McKinley uh, Memorial and Museum. And we'll give you that telephone number later on if you're interested in this. Let's go to another telephone call, but very quickly before he asked whether or not Irish issues were part of his foreign policy. Did he have to deal with them or did he choose to deal with them? No, I, immigration was uh, a slight issue, but mostly Chinese immigration at the time. So. Uh, I don't think it was a major. Now, it did, of course, become an issue prior to and after McKinley's term in office. Next call is from Mountain View, California. Good morning. Good morning. Um, McKinley was shot by an anarchist. Well, I guess you call him a communist. But uh, why do you think, uh, what, what politically did he stand for? Why, was, why do you think he was singled out by the communist or the anarchist? Well, some historians point out that McKinley's foreign policy, especially during the Philippine insurrection, which incidentally was a disaster for uh, America, we lost over 10,000 soldiers there. The Filipinos probably lost a quarter of a million of their citizens. But uh, the anarchists, of course, believed that, that there should be no government at all. The government leaders should be uh, done away with. Uh, they didn't recognize any laws. And uh, Leon Shulgaz, uh, was a disciple of Emma Goldman. Now, Emma Goldman was a, uh, you know, she was a reigning anarchist here in the United States. She'd been deported later on uh, after McKinley's death. But uh, she inspired a lot of people to create unrest in the country. And, and uh, over in Europe, probably a dozen leaders had either been assassinated or uh, 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 wounded by these anarchists. So if he was singled out, it was because he was the leader of the government, not That's because correct. of any particular policy. Uh, I know it sounds a little silly, but I don't think it was anything personal. He just, no matter who was president, uh, Shogaz was bound to uh, do away with the leader. Next telephone calls from Meadville, Pennsylvania. Hello? You're on the air. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm calling from Meadville, Pennsylvania, where uh, Allegheny College is, and, and that's uh, where he attended for a brief period of time. Just And I, and I heard a story about... Uh, one time when he was rushing a fraternity or uh, some some group or as a prank or something of uh, that nature, he uh, uh, took a uh, dragged a cow up to the top of uh, the bell tower there, and I was wondering if you knew anything about that story or could add anything to that because I that's all I've heard about it, and I just thought it was kind of an interesting story. Thank I'll you. hang up and listen to your call. Why on, why only a short time at Allegheny College? Probably a couple reasons, Susan. He uh, 
he got sick. I'm not sure what the nature of the illness was, but McKinley was also strapped financially. He found it very difficult to continue uh, college there on, on limited funds. So uh, I've heard the story about, about the cow, and I, I don't know if it's true or not. Uh, another incident that happened, I think, at, at the college was uh, he had, McKinley was very friendly. He, he uh, got along with people very well, and there were a couple southern college students attending Allegheny College at the time, and, and one of them uh, proposed a toast to Jefferson Davis, and uh, McKinley, uh, in different words, uh, said there's no way he was going to uh, toast Jefferson Davis in, in the South. Uh, this was in 1860, of course. So the nation was headed towards a civil war, and tempers were flaring. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know if that story about the, the cow is true or not, but uh, sounds like it could be. Rich McElroy has written seven books about history. He's also a history teacher in North Canton Middle School here in the Canton area. And that makes a connection for you with William McKinley, who was a teacher as well. That's right. Yeah, McKinley uh, taught for a term in Poland, Ohio, and uh, later on uh, worked in the post office in Poland. Uh, this was right before the Civil War. And I, I, have, uh, I, I teach government at the high school level and, and uh, history. At, at, to uh, eighth graders at the middle school. So Wildwood, New Jersey, on William McKinley. Hi, uh, Waldwick, New Jersey. Welcome to the program. You're on the I air. I have a comment and a couple questions. Sure. Um, I have a, a speech prepared by John Griggs, uh, I guess who was um, uh, McKinley's uh, uh, attorney general, and it mentioned specifically what you said, or what the opening presentation made about the uh, uh, McKinley giving flowers to children, uh, I guess, along the way. That was a custom of his. And I also see that uh, Lee Kindly Light was his, uh, was his favorite hymn. Um, a couple questions. Uh, number one is, was it unusual to have two people from the same city, in this case, city of Patterson, New Jersey, uh, in an administration, both as uh, the vice president, Garrett Hobart, and uh, Griggs? And uh, my second question is, what, uh, what was the relationship between Hobart and uh, McKinley? Well, Hobart was a state senator and also a millionaire, happened to be a good friend of uh, Hannah's, and uh, it was, appeared to be a safe choice. Also, being an Easterner, he balanced the ticket, uh, having a Midwesterner, or, or maybe at that time even considered a Westerner, an Ohioan, on, on the ballot. So it was a good balance. And uh, as far as Patterson, New Jersey is concerned, it, that plays another role, which I'll uh, explain here in just a minute. But uh, McKinley had a good cabinet. Uh, Griggs was a good attorney general, and uh, Patterson, New Jersey, ironically, was, was a place where uh, the seeds of the Red Carnation were shipped uh, from Lyon, France. And uh, uh, a man here in Alliance, Ohio, uh, bought those seeds and raised those flowers, and McKinley bought his flowers from Dr. Lamborn of Alliance. But uh, getting back to your question, I just think, uh, I think it was coincidental that McKinley happened to have... Uh, uh, a vice president and an attorney general, both from the same uh, area. Garrett Hobart, his first vice president. Theodore Roosevelt, his second. Why the change? Well, one major problem, Susan, Garrett Hobart had died in office, so he, he needed to be uh, replaced. And uh, the political bosses of New York, I think, thought they were getting rid of Theodore Roosevelt because he had been the governor. And if they can put him in the vice presidency, he'll they will be quiet there and won't have any power, but as it turned out, it, was, uh, it backfired on, on the bosses. But uh, Roosevelt was also a very hard campaigner for McKinley in 1900. He gave many speeches, and uh, as opposed to the 1896 campaign, McKinley decided to stay in the White House and let Roosevelt and other people campaign for his uh, re-election. In both campaigns, William McKinley was uh, challenged by William Jennings Bryan. Next, we're going to let you hear the voice of William Jennings Bryan, who the first time ran for president was just 36 years old. Let's listen in. ...behind us, the producing masses of this nation and the world, supported by the commercial interests, the laboring interests, and the toilers <clears throat> everywhere, we will answer their demand for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. <clears throat> You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. The cross of gold speech. Cross of gold speech, well known in American history. It's interesting, Susan, also that uh, among the newspaper men at the 1896 convention was a Nebraska newspaper editor by the name of William Jennings Bryan. He was in the galleries at, uh, when McKinley won the nomination in 1896. 
Why is it that, as you've described it, William Jennings Bryan was out on the road campaigning, making lots of speeches. Teddy Roosevelt, in, as a vice presidential candidate <coughs> in the second campaign, was out on the road. Both times McKinley stayed back and let others go out and, and make their points. Why did he campaign this way? Well, the front porch campaign was an idea that did not originate with uh, McKinley people. Actually, Garfield and, and Benjamin Harrison had used uh, similar techniques in, in their front porch campaign. Bring the people to me. This was, but McKinley applied this on a, on a much larger scale. And uh, Mark Hanna and, uh, again, a number of his lieutenants and, and helpers uh, organized train trips to Canton. And McKinley would come out on the front porch, pose for pictures, uh, you know, give a brief, give some brief remarks, and uh, talk to the people. And they, they thought this was very, uh, very homey, and, uh, and it worked. I, I don't think it could work today. I think it would be a Secret Service nightmare if a uh, candidate, for example, were to invite people to his home. I, I just don't think it would be very practical in, in, in times we live in. But it, it was a uh, gimmick back in those days that worked. Ida McKinley constantly frustrated by people taking little souvenirs of their home. Well, the first couple of days of the 1896 uh, front porch campaign uh, were not very successful. Uh, all the bushes and flowers were trampled. Uh, people, as you mentioned, taking flowers for souvenirs. Uh, the fence was destroyed around the house. People came barging in the back door uh, unannounced. So, uh, but after some trial and error, the, they got it straight and organized it very well, and, and uh, it went smoothly after that. Next telephone calls from New York City. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Um, I'm a uh, Cuban-American from New York City, and I have a question <coughs> regarding McKinley and the Cuban population in New York as well as McKinley and Cuba itself. Uh, in the 1890s, there was already a small Cuban community in New York City, and it included the Cuban patriot Jose Marti, who, among other things, wrote uh, newspaper articles for both the New York Sun and the New York World. Now, I've heard of yellow journalism and all these things. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask is, first of all, the first time I've ever heard uh, an American history professor say the uh, American intervention in the Cuban War of Independence uh, was actually you. Uh, you always hear of the, um, uh, the Spanish-American War, and you don't even hear the Spanish-American slash Cuban War, as if the Cuban part of the war never existed. Now. From the impression that, from what I've read and the impression that I've always had, uh, the Americans have always blotted out the Cuban participation in this war. And uh, when the war ended, it became uh, Teddy Roosevelt's uh, great uh, heroic feat, which uh, catapulted him to the White House. And then, actually, Cuban American pressure groups had to lobby Congress to get the United States to allow um, Cuba its independence in 1901. Uh, some of these issues uh, uh, can be even seen as being a, a long-term influence that even uh, led to the Fidel Castro complex in the latter half of the 20th century. I was wondering if you could comment about some of these issues. Well, first of all, as far as the rebels in Cuba go prior to the uh, Spanish-American War, many of them had been eliminated. You know, the, the Spanish atrocities in Cuba, some of which were exaggerated by the yellow press, uh, but thousands and thousands of those uh, rebels fighting for freedom uh, were either imprisoned and, and many were just uh, killed. So I had mentioned previously that some business interests in, in uh, Cuba, uh, especially uh, uh, sugar and some other uh, crops, uh, w were being threatened. But uh, the Yellow Press did a good job of drumming up support for these. Now McKinley, I, I believe, felt some of these reports were exaggerated and he felt pressured but eventually, as you know, Congress declared war. Uh, as far as the actual war itself goes, uh, that we did have some help, of course, from, from the Cuban rebels. Uh, and Roosevelt rode to glory at a charge up uh, Kettle Hill or San Juan Hill uh, in that war as well. Canton claims McKinley as a favorite son, but it's not his birthplace. Where was he born? He was born in Niles, Ohio, uh, January 29th, 1843. And uh, the Niles Birthplace Museum is not very far from McKinney's birthplace. So we're showing it on the screen right now and it is uh, no longer a humble little birthplace home. It's actually a memorial. Very nice memorial. Uh, I spent uh, a lot of time up there doing the research for the book and uh, people were very good. What's there? Well, they've got an Americana type 
a presentation. Uh, a lot of McKinley memorabilia, of course, as well. And uh, nice, li nice library is, uh, in addition to that. So I had, uh, uh, I had, I think, probably five or six visits there. And the library is open to the public? Yes, it is. And also on this tape, there is a, this is not the exact location of the birthplace, but a little bit down the road, you'll see, and that's it right there. That's where the birthplace is. There's now a, another structure there. And I think there are plans in the future to there make this a site as well? Yeah, recreate the uh, house or combination house hardware store, uh, where McKinley was born. How far is Niles from where we are right now? Well, depending on how fast you drive, Susan, probably about 45 minutes to an hour. In which direction? Uh, it's northeast of Canton. And Not far from the Pennsylvania border, in fact. We've got a map to show our audience right now just to get some sense of place where Canton is. How far is it from Cleveland? If you were Canton's driving? approximately 55, 56 miles from uh, the city of Cleveland. And how big is Canton today? Well, Canton today has a population of about 83,000 people. We had, a, I think our population peaked in the 19, early 1960s with about 135,000. But uh, the How large was it when McKinley lived here? When McKinley was here, we're probably looking at a village of about 10, 12,000. And uh, a lot of saloons. We had more saloons than churches uh, at that time. And uh, it was, uh, McKinley came to Canton originally uh, to teach uh, to uh, visit his sisters who were teaching school and to uh, get a job as a lawyer. Next telephone call, San Francisco. Hi, I'm, I was born and raised in Canton and uh, I have a comment and then a question. Um, my comment is that uh, another kind of McKinley Memorial is that a um, former McKinley High School alumni is a writer for Star Trek and often you will hear reference to USS McKinley on the Star Trek Next Generation program so his name lives on. And my question is about how the American public responded to his assassination. Um, in, in my lifetime, the Kennedy assassination was profound grief. I'm wondering how the American public responded to McKinley's death. There was a tremendous outpouring of grief over McKinley's death. Uh, we had work stoppages in this country. Uh, the stock market even ceased for a, a few minutes. Uh, bells tolled, electric lights went out for you know, certain periods uh, right at the moment of his burial. Uh, the nation was draped in black. Uh, I, I, I say that the, uh, the attitude toward McKinley's death was near that of, of Lincoln's. Of course, we had more people at the time, so we had a greater uh, show of uh, sadness or, or uh, mourning. And one of the outpourings uh, of that was the creation of this, this uh, final resting place for William McKinley. That's right. How soon after his death did the process begin? Well, I think the plans uh, were put in motion just probably a few days after McKinley's death. And uh, this, this structure behind us, Susan, took uh, about six years to complete. And I think uh, Sam Vassbinder's uh, an expert on that, and uh, he can tell us more about that. And we'll meet him in just a minute after we take a telephone call from Laguna Hills, California. You're on the air. Hi. Morning. Uh, I've done a lot of studying of McKinley since it's my family name, and uh, I was very impressed with the way he treated his wife and the way he sat next to her at dinner and so forth because she had petite mal seizures and then covered her face with a handkerchief and, and just went on talking without embarrassing her and that kind of thoughtfulness given what we have in the White House now is it, it, just remarkable and the way everyone remarked on what a, a, a good and kind deeply good man he was. Comments? Thank you for your call and your comment. I agree. I, I think Wayne McKinley spent a tremendous amount of time uh, trying to comfort his wife and uh, you know a lot of people talk about her ill health uh, and and I, I believe Ida McKinley probably had a stroke uh, after the death of her second daughter. But uh, as bad as health that she was in, she outlived all the other members of her family. So, uh, yes, he spent a lot of time with his wife, very devoted, uh, very loving. And uh, she, she could be tough as well. But we can talk, I think, about Ida a little bit later on. Uh, speaking of California, though, McKinley... Uh, uh, you know, loved California. He made a couple visits there, and I believe there's some statues of McKinley in San Francisco and 
and Golden Gate Park and some of the other places around. Ida McKinley outlived her husband by about six years and one of the things that she was uh, heavily involved in was the donation of money to create this <coughs> memorial. And next you're going to meet Sam Vassbinder who has done a study and written a book about the McKinley Memorial who will tell us a little bit more about how it was all done. Sam Vassbinder, just tell us the story if you would please. How did this monument come to be? Well, the, uh, uh, there was solicited across the United States a, uh, uh, from architects plans that would be suitable for a memorial uh, that would help to uh, in some way parallel the grief the nation felt at McKinley's death. And so uh, there were about 60 plans from architects that were um, developed and uh, some of them look like wedding cakes. However, Harold Van Buren McGonigal, who was the architect, uh, decided that that was not the right way to go. And so he built this domical building here uh, that uh, he said stretched across a gulf of 2,000 years back to Rome to the tombs of Hadrian and Theodoric. And um, you can see that this place is extremely uh, Roman with a lot of Greek overtones. The uh, uh, whole place itself is uh, shaped like a sort of liberty. And uh, once those plans were set in motion, McGonagall came here, surveyed the site. This was even then known as Monument Hill. Uh, for some reason I've never been able to find out, uh, there must have been a, uh, uh, some kind of a monument here because McGonagall regarded this as the crowning tomb of the necropolis. And um, so uh, work immediately began to progress. Uh, the, uh, Dr. Vassbinder, let yeah. me ask you about just where it is in the city of Canton and what it would have been like here then. Well, this was all farmland. Uh, everything you see around here that are uh, houses now, uh, it was all farmland, and so it was set out in uh, the uh, northwestern side of Canton, and uh, just off what was then called Plum Street. How was the ground uh, purchased or allocated to the project? Well, the, there was an organization that uh, was formed, and they uh, produced uh, the uh, plans for it, and the, a lot of money came in from everybody in the United States. It was all built with private funds. The uh, inscription on the back of the base of the statue shows that that is uh, how the money was generated, uh, well over a quarter of a million dollars. And uh, no, I guess the, one of the things that's uh, really interesting is that in the refurbishing of this place, the redoing of it, it uh, cost a considerably larger sum of money just to bring it back up to a uh, standard. Um, the um, um, community and, and the nation at large were very deeply involved. A number of states contributed materials to this. The Italian-Americans uh, first came to Canton, Ohio uh, to help build this uh, great memorial, which is behind me. And, um, the uh, uh, design is sober, uh, it encloses, it's uh, like an egg. You know, you'll notice on either side of the two doorways uh, there are upside down torches, which in the symbolism of the time meant uh, that a dead chieftain lies within. I'm going to take a telephone call and then we'll come back and learn a little bit more and it would be helpful if you can give us some perspective of size because uh, for people driving in here and who haven't seen it before there's really a, a wow factor when you uh, first turn the corner and see it for the first time. But let's take a telephone call. Albany, New York. Good morning. Good morning. Um, you've mentioned a little bit about McKinley's um, college career. What I wanted to know was I know he was enrolled in Albany Law School in New York um, for a time and that he had dropped out, I believe, of Allegheny College. I wanted to know why he went to Albany Law and how it came about that he went to Albany Law after dropping out of Allegheny. And I have another question about his um, entry into the Spanish-American War. I also know because of his war record, um, and especially the Battle of Antietam and the bloodshed being the bloodiest day of the war, that he was really reluctant to enter the war even after the explosion on board the Maine. Um, I wanted to know what turned the tide for him besides public opinion and the yellow press and war hawks like Leonard Wood and Teddy Roosevelt, um, what made him eventually enter the war? And I knew he had called for an investigation of the main explosion, um, and they had found that 
the sheets of metal on the outside of the main had been caused, um, had bent because of an explosion outside of the ship. So I wanted you to comment on why he was eventually turned um, towards war. Thank you. Questions for Rich McElroy. Thanks for your call. I, I feel McKinley's fortunes somewhat improved following the Civil War. He was looking for uh, some stability and, and direction, and uh, it, having his fortunes improve, he decided to, to go to law school. He had some uh, help uh, from some uh, attorneys in, in uh, Youngstown, and uh, he was up there for a while, uh, passed his Ohio bar exam, of course, I believe in 1866, 1867 and it came to Ohio uh, looking for, uh, back to Ohio looking for opportunities. So his, uh, his, his fortunes improved. There's, there's one incident I, I, I think, Susan, it's kind of interesting I'd like to mention. Uh, McKinley was attending a banquet near the uh, end of his uh, law studies and for the first time was served ice cream. And he thought it was custard and he thought it was frozen and he remarked to uh, a couple fellow students at the dinner table that his custard was frozen and he was going to wait till it thawed till he ate it. But uh, uh, he got a lot of ribbing about this later on. Uh, he, uh, McKinley said, you know, I was just a, a raw boy attending school and, and uh, had never experienced eating ice cream before. Uh, Second question was uh, about the entry into the war and the motivations. What well, turned the tide? As I mentioned uh, previously, McKinley uh, was pressured by the American public, by Congress, uh, by the press. Uh, but he also was aware that there were uh, some atrocities in Cuba. Uh, he had sent a number of warnings. I think maybe the straw that broke the camel's back was uh, the, the, the uh, Spanish minister to the United States writing a letter of McKinley, engaging in some name calling. And, and uh, uh, when this was made public, uh, McKinley, and, and more so the public, was upset than McKinley was. But uh, in mid-April of eight, 1898, he signed uh, the resolution of war uh, reluctantly. As President William McKinley led the country through a number of very uh, important uh, foreign policy issues, including the Spanish-American War, the Boxer Rebellion in China, and that's why just uh, four months after his inauguration, when he was assassinated, there was great public reaction to that. Sam Vassbinder is telling us more about the memorial that was built here in Canton to honor William McKinley. Well, this really is a gigantic place. It is the largest federal tomb, presidential tomb, in the U.S. Um, and it's built on a scale that continues to enlarge as one comes in. Now, the platform where I'm standing is about 120 feet in diameter. The height of the building itself is uh, a little over 100 feet. It's surmounted with a civic crown, symbolic of uh, McKinley's achievements in in law and in government, and below that is a, a bronze circlet of laurel that um, was also there as a symbol of achievement. The uh, uh, McGonagall was very aware of of how isolated this place would be, and so it's deceptive in its size. When you first pull in uh, from the street down there. Uh, you don't, it dominates you, but it doesn't dominate you the way it does as you continue to approach it and come closer to it. And uh, he spent a great deal of time proportioning the size of this place to the hill and to the approach roads. He was very, very cognizant of that problem and uh, wanted to make everything work uh, perfectly, as perfectly as he could. The uh, uh, astonishing thing is that McGonagall uh, who did not have any college training but had been trained in architectural firms was able to realize this and it's uh, in its uh, tremendous symbolism an architectural statement the uh, uh, and he knew that the size of the place was going to be impressive as one came up the steps you had the opportunity to go on these uh, these uh, terraces here which were then graveled and you could look up at the mausoleum itself and contemplate, as McGonagall said, the honored dead who lie within. How many steps? 103. Are there, is there a symbolism to the number? Uh, no, I don't think uh, there is any symbolism to the number. Um, it, the steps themselves, however, are symbolic of the lacing of, uh, or the wrapping of the handle of a sword, just as the mausoleum that surmounts the hill is a pommel of a sword that uh, has side uh, gardens that uh, go down a little flight of steps on each side and those form the uh, 
uh, Latin cross part of this memorial, just as we have the Sword of Liberty. You've also brought with you, and I'll show the audience here, uh, the, an early depiction which uh, indicates that when this was first planned, that grassy area in front of you was intended to be a reflecting pool. Yes, that's correct. It was called the Long Water. It had a few little uh, waterfalls in it to correct an optical illusion that uh, if, if you came in and the water was just lying in that lagoon, it would uh, appear to be flowing back under the steps. So uh, he uh, put those little curved waterfalls in to offset that effect. And uh, the uh, long water out there on a morning like this must have really uh, shown brightly like the blade of a sword. It was in fact a Roman officer's sword uh, that he had in mind. Let's take another call, Sam Vestminer. We'll come back and learn some more. The call is from Elliot Maine. Uh, yes, good morning. Good morning. Um, I wanted some information um, regarding the presidential China for William McKinley. Um, a great aunt gave a piece of presidential China to my mother some 60 years ago. And I've been trying to research this for years and can find no information. As he was, the gentleman was speaking, I noticed that this does have a laurel ring around the monogram in the middle. Thank you. Do either of our guests know any more detail about the presidential China? Well, I think the White House Historical Society or Association would know more about that than I would. I know Mrs. McKinley did purchase, of course, uh, pieces uh, of uh, furniture and, and uh, things for the White House kitchen and, and the state dinners, but I'm, I'm not, that's not my area of the woods, so to speak. Dr. Vestfinder, you I'm not sure if you can add anything to that. I the, can add nothing to that. Uh, I don't know anything about the presidential China. Thank Sorry. you. Thank you for the call. We can't handle all the details, but we appreciate the questions. Let's take one other quick telephone call before we return to the memorials from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm interested in, in the history of the, brother, of the sisters of William McKinley. I know that the McKinleys didn't leave any direct descendants. And my late father-in-law was a nephew. And after the president was killed, Mrs. McKinley asked, uh, different members of, of the McKinley family to pass the name on as a middle name to their children, and my father-in-law was one. He was, he was just a duplicate of w the president. Uh, we've lost track. He, unfortunately, he passed away soon after we were married, so we lost track of all the family history, but we are interested. Thank you and for I your call. If it, if it, all right, thank you. Uh, do you know any about about the descendants on uh, the... Well, first of all, side? Susan, three of McKinley's sisters, Helen, uh, Sarah, and of course Anna, uh, were, were school teachers. I believe Anna taught briefly in Kentucky before coming and settling in, in Canton. And Helen taught in Canton for a while, and uh, as well as uh, Cleveland, I believe. So education was uh, very strong uh, in the McKinley household. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was your other question? Well, the, the caller wanted to know about descendants. Uh, because he did not have direct descendants, was the family name passed down as she indicated? Yes. Did you meet any of them as you've done uh, your research? Uh, there, there are a lot of McKinley uh, descendants. Of course, as you mentioned, no direct one because he didn't have any sons. Uh, both daughters died quite young. But uh, uh, James, his brother, uh, Admir and David, uh, two other brothers, he had three brothers, uh, uh, left uh, some descendants. And, uh, you know, some. Many, many McKinley settled, uh, uh, ironically, in the uh, Arkansas, Tennessee region of the country, uh, those who are related to uh, McKinley. Sam Vassminder, we have a bit of, uh, of the old film from the dedication of the monument. When did that take place? Sam Vassminder? Oh, um, the, uh, the, the dedication of this took place on September 30th of uh, 1907. And, uh, Canton was uh, filled with throngs of people who came here from all over the nation to be part of this. Uh, the early Canton repository accounts show that uh, there was still a keen interest in McKinley and this memorial. Um, Teddy Roosevelt was here uh, as a keynote speaker as, and a special poem was written by the poet laureate, then poet laureate of America, James Whitcomb Riley from Indiana, the Hoosier poet. And um, it, was, it was quite a, quite a show. We're going to take a call, and then we'll have you direct us as we look inside at how the president and his wife have been uh, entombed. Next call is from Richmond, Virginia. Good morning, Susan. This is Charles Motley. I have two statements and then one question. 
first uh, while serving as a major in the Union Army in Winchester, Virginia. Uh, McKinley's duties were to protect and manage an Army hospital. The war had already ended then, and McKinley was impressed at the treatment received by Confederate prisoners from Union doctors. Although they fought on opposite sides, the prisoners and the Union doctors were members of the Masonic Order. When he learned the reason for this brotherly spirit, he expressed a desire to be admitted into this brotherhood. He was initiated in May of 1865 in Hiram Lodge, number 21, Winchester, Virginia, by a Confederate chaplain, J.B.T. Reed. After returning to Canton, he affiliated with the Canton Lodge, number 90. He was active in Masonic order even after moving to Washington and until his death. Five commanders of the Knights Templar escorted his remains from the White House to the Capitol on the 17th of September, and on the 19th, 2,000 Knights Templars in uniform performed with the 4th Division of the Funeral Escort. And how about that and question, secondly, sir? I'd uh, like to comment on the fraternity organization. Someone had mentioned a fraternity prank with a cow. McKinley was initiated into Sigma Alpha Epsilon fraternity at Mount Union College. He was, uh, when he was elected president, he wore his SAE badge when he took the oath of office. And the badge is now in the museum at Niles. My question is, I've heard mention of Allegheny College and no mention of Mount Union. I wonder what the connection is. Thank you. Uh, first of all, the, the uh, McKinley Lodge uh, here in Canton is Lodge 431, of which I am a, a member. It was renamed the McKinley Lodge, uh, of course, uh, after uh, President McKinley. Uh, his relationship and ties with Alliance, Ohio, that's where Mount Union College is located, were quite strong. Many of his friends lived there. Uh, uh, McKinley was uh, very familiar with the, the Alliance area. and. Uh, uh, he gave, he gave, I believe, I believe two, two commencement, commencement addresses, addresses there. there. We are going, we are to, going to take you take back. You back. I'm, getting I'm getting some feedback, feedback in my, in my ear, ear right now, right which now, I think is causing a little problem for us. But we're going to take you inside uh, the, the memorial to see the final resting place. As we do that, Sam Vassbinder, I want to tell you, uh, have you explain your comment about this being the largest uh, people get very serious about this. So how is, in, in what way is this the largest presidential memorial? Well, it, just in sheer size. Now, it, it doesn't approach the size of the memorials uh, who don't have bodies in them in Washington, D.C., but we're talking about a presidential tomb here. Uh, even Garfield's tomb or Grant's tomb is not nearly as large as this, uh, nor does it have the detailed um, thinking about all the symbolic qualities that McGonagall wanted to embody in this place and without his essay regarding them uh, probably they would have been lost. Uh, most visitors here don't understand what, that they're even moving into a sort of liberty because that long water is gone. Um, but it is the largest uh, tomb as far as I know uh, uh, but it probably um, this these staircase for example was one of the really huge staircases in America when it was built and the bronze doors that lead into the uh, mausoleum uh, area itself into the uh, mortuary chamber uh, were at that time the largest bronze doors cast in America uh, they were cast in Rhode Island and uh, they're still uh, doing their duty still very heavy covered with beautiful rosettes if we pull out just a little bit from that picture we see right now, I think there's a wreath that's, that has uh, been stationed there with the emblem First Lady. Do you know about that? Yes, the uh, uh, Saxon House, of course, is now the First Lady's library location. And uh, this is the first year, as far as I know, that there has been a wreath to the First Lady Ida. It seems that uh, long overdue, since they are both lying side by side, uh, and what what he did here, uh, if you look at the sarcophagus, you'll notice that they look like two, but they're actually carved out of one huge block of, 
of stone from Vermont, and he wanted that to symbolize the triumph of love over death. So the fact that this wreath is on the uh, parapet there surrounding the sarcophagi is, is really a, a very nice statement. Um, the women uh, finally have prevailed in putting that up because at the back of the mortuary chamber there are numerous wreaths to McKinley himself, to the commander-in-chief. Sam, Sam, I had a question. Uh, there's the marble and granite in the uh, tomb, I believe, represents four states, uh, Tennessee, Wisconsin, Vermont, and New Hampshire. But my question is, uh, I wonder if you could tell our viewers a little bit about how the uh, money was raised. I think the trustees spent uh, over $500,000 in completing the uh, project. Could you tell them how we got the money to do that? Well, as far as I know, the only, the only monies that uh, came here uh, were privately were privately donated funds and a lot of school children helped out lots of school children helped out pennies of school children really by the tens of thousands of course a dollar went a lot farther in those days a final uh, artistic note on the interior of the tomb you had commented when we were walking around yesterday about the stone eagles can you tell us a little more about what they symbolize yes uh, McGonagall opened the uh, little the four bays inside that chamber to make the sarcophagi feel less crowded he surmounted the arches with uh, fierce eagles he called them war birds and they clutch in their talons the conventional thunderbolt of zeus wrapped in olive uh, below that uh, is a uh, a keystone with the 13 stripes representing the 13 original colonies but the warbirds are poised as though for flight they're wonderfully carved and uh, they uh, produce an interesting effect because they they do seem to be watching and keeping guard over the dead below can you tell people who are interested in following along with this tour can they visit here is it open to the public it's open every day uh, opens up uh, around nine o'clock and it's open here till about six. The actual mausoleum is open till six, five or six o'clock. So anyone can visit here at, in those times. And the grounds is not just the memorial. Can you talk a little bit more about this whole area and what people will find here? Richard well, McElroy. Go ahead, Sam. Well, no, I was gonna say the museum below here uh, has lots of interesting things in it to see. And uh, the uh, whole area here is as a park with uh, lagoons and geese so and places to, to relax. So it's possible to make quite a day of it if you come here. You can make a big day of it. I'm, the, there are thousands of school children visit this site every year. It's important to note that all the, although the museum bears McKinley's name, it is not simply a museum about McKinley's history. It's much broader than that uh, and deals oh, yes. with uh, archaeology and uh, dinosaur exhibits and local history, so it's really got something for everyone. Yes, it does. Sam Vassbinder, thank you. He is uh, the author of The Architectural Symbolism of the McKinley Memorial. And he's also a teacher at Malone College in Canton, assistant professor of fine arts. Thank you very much for adding to our knowledge about the symbolism and the Victorian way of honoring the dead. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Next telephone calls. We speak about our 25th president, William McKinley, is from Pompano Beach, Florida. Good morning. Good morning, sir. I grew up in Canton. I was on the radio for many years there. And I went to McKinley High School, and at the time, Mercy Hospital was across the street. Is that the site of the famous front porch speeches? Yes, the McKinley home later became a, a part of Mercy Hospital. and. I, I think you're probably familiar with the history, but that home was moved later to what now is uh, Heritage Christian High School, Old Lincoln High School, and set in a park there. Uh, there were plans to refurbish that home after it had been moved in the 1920s. But uh, by then we were in the throes of a depression, and uh, the money wasn't available to fix up the house, so eventually it was just uh, torn down. Next call comes from Grafton, West Virginia. Good morning, Susan. Good morning, sir. Um, I have, I'll be quick with my facts. Um, I, we have the Anna Jarvis birthplace here in Grafton. Uh, she is the founder of Mother's Day. Right. Uh, here on this same land was camped um, Rutherford B. Hayes and William McKinley before the first land battle at Philippi. Also, another important fact about uh, their trip down from Ohio and right below Morgantown, 
At Fairmont, there's a place called Glover's Gap, and there the first Confederate soldier was killed by that regiment of Rutherford B. Hayes and William McKinley. So we're really proud of the fact that they camped right here on the Thunder on the Tiger project of the Anna Jarvis birthplace. It's a little town called Webster, uh, just south of Grafton and north of Philippi, uh, the first land battle of the Civil War. Thank you. I think one of McKinley's first actions was uh, chasing Morgan's raiders throughout the Ohio Valley. Uh, uh, eventually, Morgan was uh, captured near Selineville, Ohio, close to Carrollton. But uh, yeah, he spent a considerable amount of time in the Ohio Valley in West Virginia and, and southeastern Ohio. At this point, we're going to say thank you to our guests in Canton, Ohio, and take a little break. Uh, we still have an hour and a half ahead to learn more about uh, the political career, early history, and much more about the events during his administration as we discuss our 25th president. But first, uh, as this program has progressed along the way, we've been finding a number of ways to involve you. The telephone calls are important. We've also been offering a number of products for those of you who want to get involved. Uh, some of them are fun, such as this T-shirt, one of the things we have available if you uh, are interested in, in something a little bit uh, on the lighter side as your own memento. We also have educational products. Just available at the beginning today is a five-foot-long poster that is a timeline of all 41 men who served as, as president. You see it right now on your screen. And it is especially suitable for classrooms. It is available for $9.95. And if you want any of the products associated with the American Presidents, there are two easy ways to find them. AmericanPresidents.org has all the information. You can also phone a toll-free telephone number. It is 887-ON-C-SPAN. 1-8-8-8-7-7, excuse me, 1-877-ON-C-SPAN. That is a toll-free telephone number, and they'll tell you all about the uh, various products we've got available to involve you in our 41-week tour. There's the phone number on the screen, 1-877-ON-C-SPAN. All right, now we're going to go to a break, and during it, we want to tell you more about the city of Canton, Ohio. Canton, Ohio is located just south of Akron and about an hour's drive from Cleveland. Canton's history dates back as far as 1769, when a surveyor from Steubenville acquired the land and laid out the first plot. Today, Canton is often recognized as the home of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, but historically, Canton is the home of President William McKinley. There are several sites in the city that have historical significance to President McKinley. The Saxton House is the childhood home of the president's wife, Ida Saxton McKinley. William McKinley set up a law office in this house while he was serving in Congress from 1877 to 1890. Today, it serves as the home of the National First Lady's Library. The Stark County Courthouse is where McKinley served as an attorney. The courtroom you see here is known as the McKinley Courtroom. William McKinley served as prosecuting attorney in Stark County and appeared in cases in this courtroom, which is still in use today. William McKinley and Ida Saxton married at the Christ Presbyterian Church on January 25, 1871. This church was where the Saxton family worshipped. William McKinley was a Methodist, and while living in Canton, he and his wife worshipped at the First Methodist Church, now called the Church of the Savior. William McKinley taught Sunday school here for many years before politics forced him to resign. The stained glass windows in the sanctuary were a gift given by Ida McKinley in 1907. Biblical characters represent the four phases of McKinley's life. Joshua, representing McKinley the soldier. Moses, his law practice. John, representing his humanitarian efforts. And Cornelius, symbolizing President McKinley's political life. The church also has the pew in which William and Ida McKinley sat for worship. The pew has three needlepoint cushions depicting his life. The Salvation Army in Canton is home of the McKinley Window. The McKinleys were friends of William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army, and of his daughter Evangeline. In 1907, Ida McKinley donated the stained glass to the organization. It's a representation of President McKinley flanked by the United States flag and the Salvation Army flag. And finally, there's the Wirtz Receiving Vault, where President McKinley's body was placed while the McKinley Memorial was being built. The vault was created as a temporary resting place during the winter when frozen ground prevented the digging of graves. 
During the six years McKinley's body was here, an honor guard of Federal Army sentries protected the vault. Ida McKinley visited the site daily until her death in 1907. The Wirtz Receiving Vault is located in the West Lawn Cemetery, just west of the McKinley Memorial. Come with hearts and voices. Silver and gold, a major issue in the 1896 presidential campaign between Republican William McKinley and his Democratic opponent, William Jennings Bryan. We are in Canton, Ohio, on the grounds of the McKinley Memorial, as our American President series continues with the life portrait of William McKinley, our 25th president. We have about an hour and a half to go, and our telephone lines are open for your participation. Eastern and Central Time Zones should use 202-624-1111, and those of you in the Mountain and Pacific Time Zones, 202-624-1115. Richard McElroy is our guest throughout our two and a half hours on William McKinley. He's written uh, about seven history books altogether. One of those, which we have on the set today, is called William McKinley and Our America, full of pictures of the period. And it is available at the McKinley Memorial, and we'll have telephone numbers for you if you would like to call them and find out how to buy it. You can also buy it through the Borders regionally, the Borders bookstores regionally in Michigan, Ohio, other states right around here? Uh, mostly Michigan and Ohio. Okay. We're going to go to a telephone call. We have folks waiting who want to be <coughs> part of the conversation. First up, West Orange, New Jersey. Good morning. Thank you so much for this terrific series. We've enjoyed it each and every week, and you are doing a wonderful service to all Americans. Secondly, um, I've had the pleasure of visiting this beautiful site with my family, and it is just extraordinary. The, the building itself is, is awesome. The, the tomb is inspiring, and I really thank the people of America for building this beautiful edifice to McKinley. My question is, as a child growing up in Philadelphia, I recall driving around the area with my family and elderly relatives, and we would see an interesting Victorian home, and they would refer to it as a McKinley stinker. And I wondered if you knew the derivation of that term. I'll hang up, and thank you so much again. Thank you. That's a new one on me. I'd never heard uh, that term used before in describing anything, uh, actually. But, uh, you know, McKinley embodied the Victorian age in America. He, he uh, uh, I think with his death and passing, along with Queen Victoria the same year, uh, America entered, truly entered a new age. But I had never heard that term. Perhaps one of our other callers who are wonderful about adding new facts and information in these programs proceed. Let's do, uh, take another call from Phoenix. Uh, yes. Uh, my uh, third great-grandfather was uh, William McKinley's fourth great-grandfather. And uh, they came from York County, Pennsylvania. My question is, um, is that land uh, still there? Is it built on? Uh, I would like more information about uh, Margaret, uh, Margaret Morton. Uh, the, uh, thank you. Thank you. The, the ancestors of McKinley settled mainly in southern Pennsylvania near the Maryland border at York County. Of course, the Mc uh, uh, McKinley's uh, uh, grandparents had a, had a farm there. And uh, I, I don't know what has become of the land today, if it's been developed or not, I, I really can't tell you. 
Uh, I've been through the area, uh, in the general area of, of that part of Pennsylvania. But uh, I, I mentioned previously that many of his uh, ancestors also settled in some southern states. So it's a large family. Well, we're talking about family. We have not explained how Ida Saxon met William McKinley and a little bit about her own background in childhood. Well, when McKinley arrived in Canton, so it was in the, after the Civil War and after he got his, uh, uh, passed his bar exam here in Ohio to become a lawyer, uh, they met at a picnic, and uh, Ida Saxon's father was a banker. Her grandfather was a newspaper publisher. The Canton Repository is still uh, in business here. And uh, uh, they met, uh, walking, uh, often walking to church as well. Uh, she would uh, walk to the Presbyterian Church uh, where she taught Sunday school, First Presbyterian. I think uh, we showed that in uh, a clip a few minutes ago. And he would walk to the Methodist Church. And, and one day he suggested that they walk to the same church. So uh, uh, after uh, so, several, a uh, couple years of courting, uh, then they were married, I believe, in 1871. She had a job at a, a local bank? Yes, she worked, uh, which was unusual uh, in those days. Uh, she worked uh, as a teller in a bank uh, for her father. Were there any early indications of her later <coughs> poor health? No. I, I've got a couple of pictures in the book, Susan, uh, of Ida McKinley. She was just a beautiful, ravishingly beautiful lady. Uh, you know, uh, auburn hair and uh, blue eyes, uh, in, in good health, but uh, I, I told uh, our viewers earlier, I believe she probably suffered a stroke, which was not diagnosed at that time, and, and uh, several family tragedies, which occurred all in a very short period of time, probably hastened the, the decline of her health. One quote from Mark Hanna about <coughs> McKinley's devotion was that uh, Mr. McKinley makes all the other husbands look bad because of, of all his attention to his wife. And, and Ida McKinley would, uh, told Mark Hanna a couple times that uh, uh, you realize, of course, who the boss is, uh, as far as the campaign goes, meaning that it was William McKinley and not Mark Hanna. So, yeah, but they had a good relationship, the Hannas and the McKinleys. Richard McElroy and I are sitting under a pergola, which is an official part of the monument grounds here at the McKinley Memorial, just a, a few um, hundred yards away from the actual grave site and memorial of the McKinleys itself, and we are here on a beautiful day in Canton, Ohio, and delighted to be here to learn more about the 25th president. Next telephone call comes from Uniontown, Ohio. Uh, good morning. Uh, I've really enjoyed your presidential series, and I have uh, two comments and a quick question. Um, first, was uh, President McKinley referred to as the major in his time? And um, also, I have uh, heard people recently uh, comparing him to uh, uh, the way uh, Governor George W. Bush is running his campaign. And the quick question was, uh, uh, are the M McKinley's children uh, buried in the monument with the president and his wife? And I'll hang up and listen to your answer. He was referred to as the major because uh, he was, uh, before he was mustered out of the army uh, after four years of uh, civil war, in 1865 he was uh, promoted to major. So uh, that, that name stuck as a nickname for him. And uh, many of his friends, of course, uh, called him Major. Uh, as far as the little girls go, yes, they were buried in the uh, uh, walls inside the memorial. Uh, little Ida died, I believe, at six months, and, and Katie uh, passed away when she was about three and a half years old. How did they die? Well, one, one death certificate for Katie uh, listed heart, uh, heart failure as, as a cause of death. Uh, so I, I'm not sure there. I think uh, diphtheria killed the other little girl. Next call comes from Vinton, Iowa. Good morning. Thank you. I'd like to know uh, when and why they eliminated the pool of water in front of the memorial. Well, I think it became a maintenance problem after a while. Uh, uh, not, not too many years after that. Uh, you had a still pool of water there, which became a haven for mosquitoes and uh, just an inconvenience. So uh, it was it was much easier to uh, maintain that area of the monument if if it was uh, if there was no water there. So uh, today uh, we have crowds during July Fourth, which uh, sit in that area and along where the banks where the water used to be. So I think that was the main reason for it. It's a health problem. We are in the era of the great political bosses, and Mark Hanna, a, a great deal of power during the time of McKinley. Who was Mark Hanna, and what real power did he have? 
Well, the Hanna and the McKinley families knew each other when William McKinley's father lived in Lisbon, Ohio. That's uh, in uh, near the uh, Carroll County, Columbia County border, just north of Carrollton. Uh, they both lived in Lisbon and uh, uh, were friends and neighbors. And then, of course, uh, William McKinley met Hanna for the first time uh, when McKinley was defending some striking coal miners in Maslin, Ohio. Hanna owned the coal mines, but McKinley defended the coal miners free of charge uh, and uh, actually won a decision in their favor, which endeared him to uh, miners all across the country for uh, you know, the rest of his life. Hanna was a loyal lieutenant. Uh, nothing was planned without McKinley's input and final say so. You know, a lot of people picture Hanna as, as uh, you know, the master uh, puppeteer pulling the strings, and I don't think that's accurate, Susan. Where would you put McKinley's Republican politics on today's political spectrum? Well, he was a conservative, uh, you know, he, but I think he represented uh, the majority of, of, of the people back in America and, and during the Victorian age. <clears throat> uh, certainly, uh, his election results, even, even though in the popular vote, he didn't beat Bryan by that much. In the electoral vote, he, he walloped him pretty good. But uh, he was a conservative. You know, if there's one criticism of McKinley, uh, he, he may have been a little soft on civil rights. Uh, we had atrocities in the South, not during just his administration, but other presidents as well. And McKinley tried to handle these uh, uh, by talking privately with governors or congressmen. You know, some of the lynchings of, of uh, blacks and, and, and the Italians and, and the Catholics in the southern states, he found absolutely revolting. But uh, he was a shrewd enough politician to realize, too, that he needed the support of, uh, of the South when it came to uh, his presidency and, and his campaign. Mount Vernon, Indiana. <coughs> yes, I'm calling to get some information on Ida McKinley. Um, I, I read that her favorite hobby was crocheting. And while in the White House, um, she made 4,000 pair of crocheted house slippers that she gave to veterans of the Civil War North and South and to orphans during that time period. And that was her contribution, being First Lady, since she was ill in the White House and didn't leave the White House a lot. Is this a true story, or do you know? Yes, uh, she did uh, knit somewhere around 4,000 pairs of flip, si slippers, but not just. this didn't just happen while she was First Lady. I think that probably included the years her husband was uh, in Congress as well. Uh, Ida McKinley was a very kind-hearted lady. Uh, she... Uh, when anybody uh, working in the White House, uh, in the White House, on the White House staff, uh, got sick, uh, any of her friends, uh, they immediately received a personal note and a bouquet of flowers. Uh, uh, at times, uh, her illness uh, could make her maybe uh, a bit spite spiteful. Uh, she was uh, very jealous of her husband. Anybody who uh, was a threat to him or, or his career. Uh, she could give him a real tongue lashing at times. In a few minutes, we're going to go inside the, the McKinley section of the museum, and they have a pair of the slippers there. So we'll show you what they look like. In fact, they're there on your screen right now uh, with leather bottom soles and uh, fine detail. So quite a, each one of them, quite a work of art. Blue, My, sli blue slippers for northern people, uh, a gray for southerners, and I think the red pairs were for uh, orphans and widows. Miami, Florida. Uh, yes. Uh, I had two uh, comments and one suggestion, uh, short comments. One is that the uh, uh, I've been informed that the uh, assassin who, who uh, killed McKinley was a member of an organization that was started way back around 1840-something in Russia, uh, an anarchist organization which was responsible for a lot of deaths, including some grand duchess. So I'm not familiar with that. Second point, and I'd like clarification on that. Second point. Uh, his uh, Secretary of the Navy, Under Secretary of the Navy, was Teddy Roosevelt, and Teddy uh, had uh, recommended that the, uh, there were two jobs there, and that the Secretary should handle the public relations, and he would run the Navy. And uh, while he was there, when, uh, when war was declared, he sent a wire to uh, Hong Kong, to Admiral Dewey, and said, uh, we're at war, uh, proceed to the Philippines, take such action as necessary, which was an amazingly uh, 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 li liberal uh, order. And then, of course, later on he went to Cuba. The last one is I'd like to suggest for your next series, and this is a m absolutely marvelous series this is on the presidents. The next one could be on the uh, famous scientists of history. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, the Galileo and Copernicus and Tycho Brahe and Kepner and all those people who made our modern science. And then perhaps a series on modern technology of all the American inventors. The, uh, well, not all American, but uh, Marconi from Italy and, uh, and Edison and, uh, and Ford and, and uh, Steinmetz and Westinghouse and all those wonderful people who built our modern technology and made this life so different from what it was uh, in the last uh, century. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. What about, since he had an idea about science and technology and the like, how important was that at the turn of the century? Very important. Of course, uh, we uh, were a great industrial nation. Uh, I mentioned earlier in the program that uh, McKinley was probably not a man of vision. I mean, he was uh, very astute. He had good instinct. Uh, you know, back in the 1830s, Andrew Jackson made attempts to close down the patent office because he thought the country had peaked in its uh, creativity mechanically. And uh, McKinley even entertained similar thoughts, I think, while he was a congressman, uh, remarking that the patent office uh, could be drastically cut back. So, uh, uh, you know, he, he, I, he didn't possess that kind of uh, insight. But uh, he certainly... Uh, uh, supported American ingenuity and uh, creativity, and uh, it's just a very enthusiastic uh, man. He, he typified American of the 1890s. We're talking about the time period of Thomas Edison, of Mark Twain, the man of letters. What are some of the other famous names of the time? Well, the uh, uh, exposition in uh, Chicago, I believe in 1893, uh, McKinley uh, went there to dedicate uh, the Ohio building, and uh, I'm sure he was uh, surprised at some of the mechanical mar marvels and machinery there, you know, the Ferris wheel, which held over 2,000 uh, passengers at a time, uh, the electric uh, light exhibits, and so on and so forth. Uh, and McKinley uh, uh, also had a family reunion at that uh, exposition, and of course at the Buffalo Exposition, he uh, uh, you know, was supposed to dedicate that in July, but uh, he showed up in September instead, uh, where he was shot. Hamilton, Illinois. Hi. Hi. Good morning. I like Good morning. Say, I'd like to say that I'd like to say during the campaign is if uh, William McKinley had uh, debated uh, had, be, had debated uh, William Jennings Bryan in the election, he would have lost the election because Bryan would have ate him up in a in a, uh, in a public debate. <clears throat> and also that when McKinley was in the Congress, he was a civil right. He did not pay the gold standard. And that uh, also William Jennings Bryan was the first presidential candidate to ever have psychiatrists write about him in the newspapers. They analyzed him during the campaign of 1896. That's all I've got to say. Thank you very much. William Jennings Bryan, a better debater than William McKinley? Uh, well, I think William McKinley admitted that. Uh, uh, he, he knew that uh, William Jennings Bryan was, was a heavy campaigner and a, a fine speaker and, and a very talented. So he, he recognized those traits in his opponent. And uh, I, I agree that uh, perhaps if the two debated, uh, Brian could have possibly won. Uh, as far as the gold versus the silver issue, uh, you know that was that was a big uh, campaign issue of 1896. Uh, McKinley felt we should be on the gold standard, and the Democrats, uh, of course, uh, favored the free coinage of silver. But McKinley, McKinley's views changed as he became president. He realized that uh, uh, both metals. Uh, we went to a bimetallistic uh, uh, backing of the money supply, and, and the McKinley saw America emerging as, as a world power, and our, and our views uh, no longer could be isolated like they once were. William McKinley, a longtime U.S. representative, rose to the chairmanship of the Ways and Means Committee. A yeah, very powerful committee, as it is uh, today. Two-term uh, governor of Ohio yes. before being elected to the presidency for the first time in 1896 and second time in 1900. Next telephone call for him is from, about him rather, is from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Good morning. Uh, yes. My question has to do with McKinley and his relationship with William Jennings Bryan and kind of what that symbolized for the nation. I guess I have the impression that, that there was a great division in the country in 1896 because of uh, um, the, the question of the currency standard and that Brian and McKinley kind of embodied that and I just wondered if they continued to be uh, enemies personally or if the country continued to be divided in that kind of agrarian 
industrial division that those two represented. Thank you. I, I, they were not enemies. In fact, they had met on several occasions, even during the 1896 campaign. I believe they spoke at uh, two or three uh, different uh, uh, places on the same day, on the same platform, in fact. So I don't think you could call them enemies. Uh, they respected each other. Uh, McKinley left it up to his uh, campaign workers and advisors to paint the picture of Bryan as a reactionary, but uh, he personally didn't engage in uh, any criticism. Uh, I, I said that he had uh, admired uh, many of the qualities. Uh, strangely enough, during the uh, Spanish-American War in 1898, uh, William Jennings Bryan uh, served uh, in the Nebraska State Militia uh, during the Spanish-American War. I think he went down to Florida. He never saw any action. But uh, he supported the war effort of McKinley. So they were friendly rivals. They were both lawyers. And uh, although uh, uh, Brian was, I, I believe, I would say, much more energetic, uh, probably worked harder physically in the campaign uh, in 1896, at least, to become president. On the foreign policy front, in addition to the annexation of Hawaii, the Spanish-American War, which we've talked about a few times, the whole tariff and currency standard issues, which are also international in focus, the Boxer Rebellion, what was it? Well, the Boxer Rebellion revolved, involved a uh, revolt against uh, Western uh, alliances. Uh, European nations and America and even Japan had uh, gone into China and uh, uh, raped the land. They uh, took out everything from China that they could and, and left a little behind. And uh, the Dowager Empress, the uh, Queen, and many of her supporters uh, didn't like what they saw year after year after year, Western nations taking everything and giving nothing back. And uh, some of the uh, innocent victims in this uh, tragedy when these uh, boxers overthrew uh, the country, some of these were Christian missionaries and uh, many of them were killed. So uh, for about 55 days in Peking, uh, uh, these what was left of the, the Westerners there in China uh, were besieged by uh, tens of thousands of these uh, boxers. If you've been following this series uh, since its beginning in March, you know we have three producers overall. Today's installment is being produced by Paul Brown. Next telephone call on William McKinley is from Chicago. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Mr. McElroy. Uh, yes, sir. Can you please tell us uh, about the accomplishments and failures of uh, President McKinley as a member of the House and uh, of representatives and also as governor of Ohio? And I noticed that he did not serve uh, consecutive terms in the House. If he lost an election, can you tell us to whom and uh, what the circumstances were uh, regarding the campaign? Thank you so much. There were some contested uh, results in his, I believe, his fourth congressional, fourth or fifth congressional election, and, a, and an opponent from Maslin, Ohio, was declared the winner. So McKinley vacated his seat uh, for a while, uh, but then later returned to Congress. So he, he wasn't out of Congress uh, very long. Uh, as far as uh, his accomplishments go, especially as governor, uh, one of the things I cite in my book is that uh, he did push through some reforms, uh, especially rights for workers, the right to uh, uh, join unions, uh, rights for railroad workers. Uh, women also received the right to vote in the school board elections in Ohio, which was a, a, a big uh, uh, stepping stone towards uh, suffrage uh, back in those days. And uh, uh, of course he had, uh, one, of, one of the things about McKinley is that he was able to achieve some things legislatively by killing bills in the Ohio House and later on by killing bills uh, in the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives. So by not, by preventing some of these pieces of legislation from uh, surfacing, uh, he was able to achieve some of his goals. We are in Canton, Ohio, which is uh, not the birthplace, but really the hometown of the adult uh, William McKinley. We have a map where we can show you where it is in the state of Ohio if you have not ever been here before. And again, if you were to drive uh, from the Cleveland airport, how far would it be? The, the trip probably takes about uh, 50 minutes, uh, close to an hour, and uh, just go right down uh, Route 77, and it takes you right into Canton. And, and from uh, 77, there are lots of signs that will direct you to the McKinley Memorial. 
And also, this is the hometown of Wayne McKinley's wife, Ida Saxton. We have some videotape of the Saxton home. I'm going to show that next uh, after the skyline of Canton. And tell us a little bit about where she was uh, born and raised, if you would. Born and raised right here in Canton, of course. And uh, they lived at a, a home on uh, North Market Street, which today presently is the uh, Stark County District Library. But uh, the Saxton home uh, on South Market in Canton was a temporary home for uh, the McKinleys. And of course today it's a, a home of the First Lady's uh, Library. And uh, we're really proud of that site. Uh, they do an outstanding job in maintaining that facility. First Lady's Library was just dedicated earlier this year. And the uh, current First Lady, Hillary Rodham Clinton, came for those ceremonies and also laid a wreath at the foot of Ida McKinley's tomb here at the memorial. And right across the street, Susan, is the uh, Canton Repository, which uh, Ida's grandfather uh, founded. Next telephone call is from Verona, New Jersey. Uh, yes, uh, I just want to first compliment C-SPAN on this uh, wonderful series. Uh, I myself uh, am an elected uh, uh, public servant, and uh, I've always been interested in, particularly, in particular about how the uh, various party ideologies change and evolve over time. William McKinley uh, made his career, and even as the Oscar Brand uh, song just indicated, uh, ran on uh, a platform of strict protectionism and high tariffs. Uh, today, with the exception of Pat Buchanan, the Republican Party is uh, uh, committed to free trade, and most protectionist sentiments will be found in the Democratic Party. I was wondering whether or not uh, there was a free trade uh, uh, element in the Republican Party in McKinley's time that opposed his uh, protectionist views, and what, uh, secondly, what was the, uh, the, uh, the opposition of the Democratic Party? Uh, how did they feel about uh, high tariffs and protectionism uh, uh, in 1896? Or did, that, uh, did their free trade views uh, only blossom later as the Republicans did? Uh, you had some free trade Republicans as well as some high tariff Democrats at the time. But uh, I think after several years of work in Congress, McKinley was able to persuade uh, his fellow legislators that uh, the high tariff would protect American interests and, and uh, President Cleveland uh, did not sign the uh, McKinley tariff into legislation but it became law nevertheless because he let it he let it left it on his desk unsigned for 10 days so even though President Cleveland did not approve of the McKinley tariff he still let it become law and uh, you know, later on, again, uh, becoming part of an international uh, stage, uh, McKinley as president, seeing the United States as a world power, uh, he, he changed his views on tariffs uh, uh, as somewhat as he did on uh, uh, the silver gold issue. Garden Grove, California, your question. Hi. Um, I work for a uh, children's agency out in California that was named after uh, President McKinley, and my question is, did he ever make it out west? And what was his role in all of the reforms that were going on in regards to uh, children, child labor, compulsory education, and some of those social reforms of the time? Thank you. Uh, he pushed through some reforms as a uh, Ohio governor when uh, he was down in uh, Columbus. And uh, uh, you know, you remarked that a lot of things are named after McKinley. I believe we have 20 schools right here in Ohio, Susan, that are named after McKinley, in addition to just a plethora of, of uh, private companies and, and streets and thoroughfares. So it's a very popular name. Yes, he made a couple trips out to uh, California. Uh, one of his brothers lived out there after he was, uh, after his brother, I believe it was David McKinley, was counsel to uh, Hawaii uh, in the uh, late 1880s. Uh, he resided in San Francisco, I believe. But uh, they made a couple trips out there. And of course, the old fated uh, trip in 1901, uh, uh, they made out to the West Coast and the Southwest. Ida McKinley almost died uh, during that trip. And uh, this brought the train back to Washington, D.C. And uh, he had to cancel his trip to Buffalo in July. And, and it went in September instead. So uh, big admirer of the West. How many states were in the Union during McKinley's presidency? I believe we had 45 states uh, during McKinley's presidency. No states entered the Union during his presidency, but uh, McKinley did uh, uh, solidify efforts to uh, make sure that Hawaii and Alaska were annexed to the United States. So he's mainly responsible for uh, the 59th or, uh, or 50th and 49th uh, states joining the Union. Population? Uh, during McKinley's time? 
uh, somewhere around 70 million and uh, 67, 70 million because he was in office for five years there. Uh, we had a tremendous influx of uh, immigrants uh, into the country, of course, at that time. Uh, many blacks from the south moving into the cities. And uh, it was an exciting, uh, dynamic period of American history, the 1890s. Fairfax, Virginia, on Way McKinley. Good morning, Susan. Good morning. Mr. McElroy. Uh, Good morning. My, my uh, comment goes to the fact of McKinley's popularity. And just as John, uh, John Kennedy was put on the 50-cent coin the year after his death, Roosevelt was put on the dime the year after his death. Uh, Mr. McKinley was put on the national banknote ten dollar denomination uh, in nineteen two and stayed on that note until nineteen twenty nine and then when the uh, Federal Reserve uh, notes were reduced in size, he was put on the five hundred dollar bill and stayed until they stopped printing those I believe in nineteen forty eight yes. Yeah, those, those notes are used primarily among banks, uh, no longer used by uh, the public. Uh, McKinley was also uh, put on, I think, three different, at least three different postage stamps uh, throughout the 1900s as well. So uh, that's interesting. I'm, I appreciate your call on that. Richard McElroy and I are sitting under a pergola on the grounds of the McKinley Memorial. Right behind uh, Mr. McElroy's shoulders are the, is the memorial and the tomb site. Uh, which uh, hold the remains of Ida and William McKinley. And if you look down the grassy plaza, there's quite a lot of acreage here as well, you'll see the McKinley Memorial. And we are going to take you inside the McKinley Memorial right now uh, to the second floor of that where they have a gallery that is devoted to the history of our 25th president, William McKinley. And right now we're making that trip down the 103 stairs and there you see the museum on the right as you're standing at the top of the tomb. Again, on the second floor inside, there's the McKinley Gallery. And as you enter the gallery, a very, very large photograph depicting the front porch campaign. Then you enter in past a portrait of the uh, late president inside doors that are typical of uh, Ohio wealthy house, uh, houses of the period. And there, standing inside, is Jennifer Sowers, who is the curator of the McKinley Museum. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. You've got a number of rooms inside uh, depicting various po uh, times of McKinley's life. Uh, why don't we start with the first right behind you, if we could, and that's his law office and period of time in Canton, Ohio. Yes, this part of the room is actually designated uh, as McKinley's law office and his personal office from his home, and uh, most of the artifacts that you see around me are either um, from McKinley's period or were specifically uh, pieces that he owned. Uh, to my left here you'll see a printing or a letterpress that he had in his law office. It was used to make copies of letters since um, lawyers have to make so many copies of uh, all of their official documents. Um, also just behind that you'll see this desk uh, which was his personal desk in his law office. And uh, it's set up not necessarily the way that he would have set it up, but uh, the way that you might find any lawyer's office in that period. Rich McElroy, what kind of a lawyer was he? General practice or specialized? General practice. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier that he had defended coal miners in Maslin. He uh, took care of wills and estates. Uh, he uh, defended uh, people, uh, especially poor people, uh, maybe accused of uh, some crimes. but. Uh, he was a very outgoing, uh, gregarious man and a very hardworking lawyer. He had to be in Canton, Ohio. There's a lot of competition there. Jennifer Sowers, I'm going to ask you because many people have been uh, visiting a number of these sites with us, might wonder why it's necessary to wear gloves. Um, actually, I'm wearing my gloves today because I thought that I might touch some of the artifacts in this room. And uh, the oils and the chemistry in our bodies um, actually has detrimental effects on many of the precious items that we take care of here at the museum. Uh, this item that I'm touching right here is a revolving bookcase. It's a Danner revolving bookcase from the turn of the century, actually made... Um, in the 1800s just into the 1900s. Uh, it's an arts and crafts piece and it's, as you see, it revolves so that uh, you could store quite a few books on it uh, in just a very small space. So oh. that's why I have my gloves on. <laughs> How long have you been at the museum? I've been at the museum since May. How did you become interested in the study of history? Well, actually that's a long story. I was born here in Canton, Ohio, so um, I grew up here coming to the McKinley Museum and uh, it's 
been something that I've always been interested in. I am actually a medieval and renaissance historian, uh, but McKinley history, like I said, has been a part of my life since childhood. So uh, when I found the opportunity to be here at the museum, I welcomed that. How many artifacts does the museum have pertaining to McKinley? Uh, to come up with a specific number, I can't do that right offhand, but I can tell you that we do have the largest collection of McKinleyana anywhere in the United States. Where are William McKinley's papers, presidential papers, stored? Uh, all of his papers uh, are stored downstairs in our Ramsayer Research Library. It's open three days a week or by appointment, and uh, we have an extensive archive down there. Do you have the full collection, or does the Library of Congress also have some? Uh, the Library of Congress does have some. We have quite a large collection, um, but you can find McKinley items and documents other places. We're going to take a telephone call from Houston, Texas, as you make your way to the next area of the McKinley Gallery. Okay. Houston, you're on the air. Hello. Yes, uh, Mr. Uh, or Dr. McElroy, how are you today? Uh, what, I, what my call is about is this. Uh, uh, McKinley's first vice president was Garrett Holbert. Can, can you hear me? Yes. yes sir. Yes, okay, it was Garrett Holbert. Uh, I, I stand corrected. Uh, what I'm trying to find out is, is I think he died in his uh, first term, and uh, then that's when Teddy Roosevelt came in as the uh, vice president. And one of the questions I have is, is that uh, did uh, McKinley feel any pressure uh, or uh, was Teddy Roosevelt virtually running the country when he was actually became the vice president? And then my next question is, uh, did uh, at the assassination of uh, William McKinley, did, uh, did they thoroughly investigate Leon Shogos and the movement he was with and, uh, since it was in Buffalo, New York? Uh, and what were their findings uh, concerning uh, the assassination of William McKinley? Thank, Thank you. you. In regard to your first uh, question, sir, McKinley left it up to the convention to choose uh, the vice president. Uh, I, I think privately he had some concerns with Teddy Roosevelt becoming the vice presidential candidate uh, and, and made those concerns known to Mark Hanna, uh, although nothing is documented there. but. Uh, you know, let, let the delegates choose uh, the vice presidential candidate. He knew Teddy Roosevelt would campaign very hard for him, and, and uh, that was the case. And what was that second question? Was the investigation of his assassin? I, I think uh, a, a number of uh, police departments all throughout the country, uh, Detroit, Cleveland, uh, little towns in West Virginia, uh, police officials everywhere, uh, Chicago, uh, investigated uh, Leon Shogaz and, and traced uh, his movements. Uh, of course, this took you know, several months to do. And eventually they came up with a pretty good picture, or portfolio of his activities. And uh, he had used a number of aliases at one time. Um, I, I believe that uh, Shulgaz Shul was probably in Canton, Ohio, uh, stalking McKinley here uh, this summer uh, of 1901. And uh, he was a drifter. Uh, I think he was born and raised near Detroit, came from a, a fragmented, uh, dysfunctional family. and. Uh, but Emma Goldman, uh, again, the leading anarchist at the time, uh, inspired him, and, and uh, he followed uh, McKinley to Buffalo in 1901 and, and pulled, the, pulled the trigger twice. And he admitted it from the very beginning? That he, had he really made no attempt to uh, get away, Susan. He was uh, he wrestled to the ground very quickly. Uh, ironically, we had probably 60, 80 uh, uh, policemen and, and uh, soldiers around for security, but uh, he managed to get through. And, and I might say that the, the couple Secret Service agents who were there at the time uh, let Shulgaz slip by. You know, he, the, the rule was you're supposed to have your uh, uh, hand showing, and that hand was bandaged, and uh, there was a gun inside. We're going to come back and spend much more time on that in our final half hour. You'll also see some early footage of the period of the president visiting the Pan Am Exposition and some, uh, some film that is purported to be the execution of Cholgaz, the assassin. And much of the video, actual film, old film we're showing you today comes from the collections here at the McKinley Museum. And we have to thank the folks here for that. And perhaps you can tell us a little bit, Jennifer Cyrus, about your, uh, your uh, film collection. Um, we do have a film collection. I am not specifically familiar with all of it. Um, our librarian, Bud, 
um, is Bud Weber is very in tune with the library and uh, unfortunately since I've been here I haven't had much opportunity yet to get into our film collection. Are, is it open for the public or is it for scholars to use generally? It's mm -hmm. both. Um, if, they, if there are members of the public who are specifically interested in seeing those items they can come during the time that the library is open. Uh, it's open three days a week in the afternoons and or they can call uh, here to the museum and we can refer them to Bud who uh, would be happy I'm sure to help them with their research um, both for scholars and for members of the public. I'd like to give you the telephone number for the museum. This is not to get through to the program but this is to the museum. It's a place where you can buy Rich McElroy's book and other artifacts uh, connected with the, I shouldn't call your book an artifact, it's a work of art, <laughs> <laughs> connected with the, the McKinley presidency. And they have information about the, uh, the site and when you can visit. It's 330 Four five five seven zero four three. It's on the screen right now. Let me give it to you one more time. Three three zero is the area code. Four five five seven zero four three. And Jennifer Sowers and Rich McElroy, if you'll be kind enough to listen into one more telephone call, we'll come back and look at the presidential uh, White House area of the McKinley exhibit. Let's listen into Akron, Ohio. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, as I understand, McKinley was. Uh wounded twice in the abdomen or chest, and he died about eight days later from his wounds. Um, could you tell me about the uh, final days of his uh, confinement in that regard and whether a post-mortem examination was performed? Thanks. We're going to hold that question off uh, because we do have uh, much more detail, and we, will, we promise you we'll give you some more uh, information on that. Jennifer Sowers, so tell us yes. about the White House part. Um, this area that I'm standing in right now is our presidential parlor area and uh, most of the pieces that you see here either were in the White House with the McKinleys or would have been found in their parlor at home. Um, they're typical Victorian pieces and uh, some of the ones that you'll see as um, the camera pans around, you see first of all on the right there um, two animatronic um, Figures. One is Ida Saxton. She's seated and dressed in a reproduction of one of her dresses uh, and wearing a beautiful brooch, which is very typical of Ida. She was quite a connoisseur of, ju of jewelry. Uh, and next to her is uh, President McKinley. On her lap, she has a knitting bag. Uh, Ida was um, always busy <laughs> with her knitting. And uh, just on the table there next to her, or a pair of booties that actually she knitted. She knitted thousands of pairs of booties in uh, blue, gray, and red uh, Civil War colors and gave them uh, both to um, Civil War veterans and also to orphans left by the Civil War. And some of those knitting bags had a photograph of the president at the bottom of them, so every time she opened it she could see his likeness? Yes, that's right. We have one here at the museum actually that's uh, open and there is a photograph of the president there so that she could keep him close to her at all times. And you, you want to show us the children's chairs in that section? Yes, actually I'm standing right behind a chair here that's a convertible uh, high chair. This belonged to Katie, their first daughter who lived to be three and a half. And it's an interesting piece because it originally locked in this position to be a high chair. But uh, if I let go of it, it converted down like this and these would roll up so that it would actually become a rocker. We'll let you move on to the next part of the exhibit, and we'll take a telephone call. Once again, it's from Mount Vernon, Missouri. Go ahead, caller. Uh, yes, uh, this is Mount Vernon, Missouri. So, uh, well, back when I was in college, I took a, a course from, uh, this is for Mr. McElroy, right? took a course from uh, in the Amer an American presidency from a fellow named William McKinley Evans. Who has some who has some relation? And the question I have is this: um, You you uh, showed a picture of Garrett, Garrett of uh, Garrett Hobart Hobart well ago, a minute ago. Had there been? I want you to would like Mr. McElroy to comment on this. Uh, had there been a had there been a 25th Amendment, it might have been different. And uh, one last statement. Um, Leon Shogos had a, had a dubious distinction, you might say, of being the first assassin to be electrocuted. Thank you. Uh, with Thank you. Appreciate the call. Thank you. I, I think he was the first uh, prisoner in the state of New York to be uh, electrocuted with uh, alternating current. Uh, that was in uh, New York in 19, 1902, I believe. First vice president. 
Uh, as mentioned before, Garrett Hobart was a, uh, a very wealthy uh, state senator from uh, New Jersey and a friend of the Hannas and uh, had campaigned uh, for McKinley's uh, nomination and uh, to try and secure delegate votes. So this was his reward. He appeared to be a, a safe uh, uh, candidate. How many years that did he serve as vice president before uh, his death? A little bit more than three years before he got uh, sick and, and died. And the position was not filled. It was just until, it was the, not filled. until the next election when Theodore Roosevelt was nominated to, ser to run as vice president. Right. It's interesting, Susan, if I can add, uh, during my research at the Library of Congress, I was digging up some pictures uh, uh, for the book on McKinley, and I met uh, Garrett Hobart's, uh, I think, great nephew or something like that. So I, I talked with him. That was interesting. Harwich, Massachusetts. Hi, I have a question. Uh, you talked about um, President McKinley taking trips out to California. Uh, I was wondering if presidents during that time, like Harrison and Cleveland and, and McKinley, had their own railroad car, uh, you know, specifically for them for traveling, like we have Air Force One today. And the other question I had was, uh, since railroads were, uh, I mean, transportation was much better than, uh, certainly than during Washington's day and, and Adams and Jefferson, uh, did the presidents during that time uh, travel to all 40 or all 45 states uh, during the term of office and, and visit? And I was just wondering how, how good transportation was uh, during that era. Well, the railroad companies, of course, provided private uh, transportation accommodations for the presidents. And uh, yes, McKinley did have his uh, personal railroad car. And uh, uh, of course, his trip uh, was a campaign trip as well as a, a pleasure-seeking uh, venture as well. But uh, some presidents didn't travel very much. They stayed in the White House, uh, uh, pretty much restricted to the Washington, D.C. Uh, eastern area. Uh, many, however, would take vacations in the summer during a congressional break. And uh, McKinley had a, a vacation home. Uh, he vacationed in, near Thomasville, Georgia, uh, especially uh, during uh, the campaigns. But uh, <clears throat> Yeah, he tra he traveled quite a bit. I, he knew he knew his country very well. Let me just fire some quick factual questions at you. How tall was William McKinley? McKinley was quite small. He was uh, about five foot seven. How uh, much did he weigh? Well, during his presidency, uh, he probably weighed a little bit too much, uh, near near two hundred. In fact, in times exceeding a little bit over two hundred pounds. He had a weight problem. Didn't get a lot of exercise. Did he smoke or drink? Uh, he was a prodigious cigar smoker. But uh, he kept it private. He wouldn't smoke in the presence of his wife. Uh, he would never smoke a cigar in public. But uh, he enjoyed uh, cigars and uh, didn't get, like I said, a lot of exercise. Uh, he would occasionally go for walks or uh, rides in a, in a carriage. Favorite pastimes? He loved baseball. He was a big baseball fan, and he missed out on a real opportunity, Susan, to throw out the first pitch in a Major League Baseball game. That honor, of course, went to William Howard Taft several years later, I believe in 1907. But uh, McKinley was a big supporter of baseball in Canton. Uh, he helped organize a, a Stark County team here for when he was president of the YMCA. Uh, he supported the uh, minor league team down in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And their manager, Gus Schmelz, later became manager of the Washington national team. And uh, arrangements were, were made for McKinley to throw out the first pitch. But uh, he, he had some pressing business and didn't show up. So uh, he never got to, but he got to several games, but not the first game. Jennifer Sowers will return to you in the McKinley Gallery, uh, where we are in another section. Can you tell us about where you are? This is actually the White House section uh, of our gallery here. And you just mentioned uh, how tall McKinley was. And the interesting thing is that we actually have right next to this beautiful partner desk, which was McKinley's desk in the White House, we have a stand that McKinley actually used to stand on in order to give his speeches because he was... Uh, too short to be seen above the crowd, so he would actually stand on that to give speeches. Um, the partner desk next to it uh, would have been his desk. Probably, um, you can sit at either side, and uh, McKinley would have sat behind it on one side, and on the other side would have probably been his personal secretary, uh, George Cordelieu. What else is in the room? Uh, behind, next to me here on this, the left side is a brass bed. They, we have two in our collection. Uh, one was McKinley's bed in the White House, and the other next to it was Ida's bed. And the final thing in that section is a collection of telegrams. Yes. These telegrams to my right here are um, uh, correspondence that were sent from Buffalo back to Canton and to Washington uh, about the president's condition and his assassination. I'm going to ask John Kelly, who's on camera, to get as close as he can so people can see the urgent nature of these telegrams. And uh, Rich McElroy, uh, perhaps you can talk about 
the country waiting for news of the president's and how that news was communicated? Well, news flashes were uh, 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 put on display, of course, at Times Square uh, on an hourly basis. Uh, the whole nation uh, was waiting anxiously. The initial reports by the doctors, Susan, uh, had McKinley improving health, but uh, uh, one or two of those dozen or so doctors uh, realized that McKinley might not make it through this because of uh, infection. So uh, there was a tremendous uh, concern, and uh, you know all these things have been uh, forgotten, I think, uh, for numerous reasons. But uh, yeah, telegrams came from all over, uh, not just the United States, but from all over the world. Jennifer Sowers, pick out one or two and read them to us so we can hear, uh, hear uh, today what they were writing about the president's condition. Would you? Uh, certainly. Um, the one that I see first is uh, received at Cleveland, Ohio. It's for the repository. It says, Dan R. Hanna, son of Senator M. A. Hanna, has just received a telegram from his father at Buffalo that President McKinley is worse and cannot live. Um, there's another one uh, that comes from Cordelou. Uh It's dated September 7th, and it says the president's physician is sued following bulletin, or, excuse me, issued, <laughs> there's a skip there, uh, the following bulletin at 6 a.m. The president has passed a good night, temperature 102, pulse 110, respiration 24, signed, and it's signed by several members, uh, including George B. Cordelou, secretary to the president. You can see that there were regular updates on uh, all aspects of the president's health after the shooting. Well, we're going to take a telephone call, have you make your way to the last item that we'll be able to show in okay. the exhibit, and that telephone call is from Columbus, this is, uh, Columbus, Missouri. Columbus, yes, you're on Columbus. the air. Yes, Columbus, Mississippi. Mississippi, thank you for correcting me. You're on the air, go ahead. Yes, good morning to you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to reserve my last question because you're going to talk about the assassination. But uh, my first question is, pertaining to the African-American community, did McKinley have any relationship with any of its leadership, uh, particularly uh, Booker T. Washington? Yes, he made a stop at Tuskegee Institute, I believe, in 1899 mm -hmm. or 1900. And uh, this concerned, of course, a lot of the uh, southern white voters. but. Uh, McKinley had a, a good relationship with uh, uh, black Americans. Uh, he had invited uh, several black Americans to the White House for uh, entertainment, uh, musical presentations. Uh, another thing McKinley did, which was unheard of, in the 1896 uh, convention, I believe that was in St. Louis, uh, some black delegates were not allowed to be in the same hotel as the white Republican delegates. What about that? Uh, he, he went into a tizzy, so he made it known that uh, black delegates were going to stay in the same facility uh, as the uh, white ones. So uh, I mentioned previously, too, that he was probably a little soft on civil rights. You know, during all these atrocities in the South, uh, McKinley tried to handle these uh, brutalities in a, in a private, uh, non-public way. And, and uh, you know, he was smart enough to recognize that he needed the support of all Americans. Uh, one of the things, one of the, one of the trade-offs here is that McKinley was able to heal the divisions between the North and the South, which were still pretty deep uh, in the 1890s. Right in Massachusetts. Good morning. Uh, compliments to C-SPAN on this excellent series uh, and all the work you do. I have a question, and I'm listening online, so I'm not able to, haven't been able to listen to the entire program. But about, regarding the pronunciation of uh, the name Roosevelt, now I've always pronounced it Roosevelt, and I've heard Roosevelt or Roosevelt. I would suggest that it's Roosevelt, uh, Roosevelt, and the, the standard pronunciation rules of the English language don't apply to people's names, number one. And number two, there is an existent film clip of Franklin Delano Roosevelt actually pronouncing his own name as Roosevelt. So I just wanted to get that on the air. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, we have the same problem with Scholgaz's name as well, but uh, it, it's Dutch. Roosevelt is Dutch for a field of roses, so I, I prefer Roosevelt as well. And uh, William McKinley's selection, or actually the Republican delegate selection of Theodore Roosevelt as McKinley's vice president propelled him into the White House just four months after the start of the second administration. And we will be spending our next time in our American President series with our 26th president, Theodore Roosevelt, live from Oyster Bay, New York, on Friday, the 3rd of September. So if you're interested in that presidency, join us beginning at 9 a.m. Eastern time. But back to William McKinley, the final thing we will be able to see in a very extensive collection here at the McKinley Memorial with Jennifer Sowers is 
the bed shirt he wore as he attempted unsuccessfully to convalesce from his wounds. That's right, Susan. Uh, in the case beside me is a bed shirt that was worn by McKinley while he was uh, laying for that week after he was assassinated. Uh, the back of the shirt, you may not be able to see in this shot, but is slit up the back so that they would be able to reach him and care for him. The gun that you see laying on top of the shirt is not actually the, the specific gun that shot him, but it is the same make and model. Jennifer Sars, thank you for taking us on tour. As we close with you, we, you want, Susan. we want to show people a little bit more of the inside of your museum. If Certainly. you could talk generally about what else people can find there. Certainly. Our museum is a museum of McKinley history, but it's also a history, science, and industry museum. Uh, we have a history hall right behind me that has uh, period rooms from different stages of the uh, history in this area of the country. We have uh, a full-scale size um, town recreated here in part of the museum. Uh, we have a hall of local industry and downstairs we have Discover World which is a, an interactive science area specially designed just for children. All bearing the name of McKinley. Yes. And when is it open and available for the public? Uh, this is the last week of our summer hours when it's open daily from 9 to 6 and Sunday noon to 6 but uh, during the rest of the year it's open 9 to 5 and noon to 5 on Sundays uh, all days except major holidays. And uh, go ahead, if you have something to add, please. I, I, I feel it's one of the, I call it the best little museum in America. It's, it's run by- Thank uh, you, Rich. <laughs> uh, and Joy Shutt and uh, the staff do a great job, and, and Jennifer's really enthusiastic, and, and uh, I'm, I'm really proud of it. Uh, I, most of the research for my book, Susan, was, was uh, spent in the library going through the papers, uh, and, and I mentioned the, the Niles uh, McKinley Birthplace Museum as well. This is a, a Rich McElroy's book. It is a pictorial history of William McKinley and the American period. It's available at the gift shop here. And let me give you the telephone number one last time, 330-455-7043. I, I want to emphasize, Susan, it's a pictorial history. It's, it, the definitive biography of McKinley by H. Wayne Morgan is, is probably the best. And, and Margaret uh, Pulitzer Leach wrote a, a, a book called In the Days of McKinley, which is quite excellent. But uh, there's about 650 photographs in there, and a lot of the actual writing was done in uh, Bel Air, Michigan, uh, or at our summer cottage up there. So uh, it took about eight years to do, and, and uh, it, it turned out very well. It was a team effort, though. 30 minutes left to go on our program on William McKinley. We're going to spend most of that time with details about his assassination, and we have uh, several pieces of historic footage to show you that has come from the museum here and we want to thank them for their help in, in uh, making this all come to life for you. Before we do that, let's take some more telephone calls. Glens Falls, New York. Good morning. Great series. Thank you. Uh, I, I have two questions relating to uh, President McKinley and the early automotive industry in, in the country. Uh, I had read somewhere that he was the first sitting president to ride in a locomobile that was actually powered by the Stanley Brothers steamer engine. And secondly, uh, right after the assassination, I believe the pres attempt, I should say, the president was taken to the Milburn House in Buffalo, and I'd read a couple points that that was in a electric ambulance. I wonder if your expert could uh, comment on that. Thank you. Thank you. You're quite precise on that point. He was the first incumbent president to ride an automobile. I think uh, uh, his first trip resulted in a speed of about 28 miles per hour, which was uh, horrifying to a lot of Americans at that time. But that wasn't a Stanley steamer. Uh, the vehicle that took uh, McKinley uh, to the infirmary uh, from the Temple of Music where he was shot, I believe, was an, an electric, uh, small electric truck, uh, ambulance. So uh, you're correct on that. Fremont, California. Yes. Yes. On the air. Yes, ma'am. This is Fremont, California. Uh, do you Go ahead me? with your question. We, we can hear you fine. I wanted to say that uh, I have a card that was given out by uh, President McKinley when he appeared in uh, uh, Oakland, California in 1900, and uh, it's in very good condition. And I wondered if there would be anybody uh, that would care to have it. I would be glad to send it to them. There's a lot of McKinley memorabilia, especially in this part of the country, and uh, yeah, that might have uh, some value. Uh, as a collector of autographs, I can tell you that um, if, if it happened to be signed, uh, the McKinley uh, autograph would run anywhere from 100 maybe to $200, depending on, on uh, when it was signed and what kind of a document a signature is on. But as far as uh, postcards and, and uh, uh, 
pictures and things like that. There's a lot of that available. So there would be some historic value, but not much. Next call is from Fitzgerald, California. Caller, you're on the air. Uh, Fitzgerald, Georgia. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. All right, we don't have that caller. Let's move on. Catawba, North Carolina. Catawba, North Carolina, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Um, I wanted to, uh, to ask a question. As with, this is a wonderful series, and uh, I've learned a lot from it. I'm a student of history myself, so uh, these presidential, uh, these presidential uh, things that you're doing is very, very interesting. But uh, as with uh, Grover Cleveland earlier in the series, there was a quote-unquote a voice recording made of him, and uh, I was wondering if William McKinley, who is one of our lesser-known presidents, uh, obviously, if there was a voice recording made of this man, and, and, if, and if you could play it or if one sure. exists. Uh, well, thank you. We played one in the beginning of the program, and uh, your question uh, will lead us right into our next section, which will include some uh, actual audio of William McKinley's speech. Uh, let's take this in a particular order so we can do the chronology of events. We have some uh, old vi uh, footage of the Pan Am Exposition in Buffalo, New York. We'll show that. Will you talk about what it was and why they invited the president to attend? Essentially, Susan, it was the World's Fair, and McKinley had uh, planned to uh, make the dedication at Buffalo in uh, the summer, early summer of 1901. Uh, he was going to swing back to the East Coast after his trip out west to do this. Let me but, interrupt. Right behind sure. the soldiers, the gentleman whose hand goes up and down is William McKinley. Okay, thank you. Ida had a uh, finger infected and nearly died from uh, blood poisoning. In fact, arrangements were made for Ida's funeral while they were in uh, California uh, during the spring of 1901. So this uh, prevented him from going to Buffalo upon the original date. So uh, he told him that uh, in September he would be able to uh, attend the ceremonies. But it was a World's Fair and exposition. And here's the President and the First Lady coming indoors for some of the ceremonies. Enormous crowds it looked like. At this Big time. crowds, huge crowds. And we can see the President taking his seat right there. When, when the President first arrived there in, in uh, September of 1901, uh, there was a 21-gun salute, and the, the uh, concussion from the blast of those cannons, Susan, was so tremendous it shattered train windows, and Mrs. McKinley fainted. So uh, it was quite a, a, a welcoming committee. There's a good view of President McKinley as he's uh, taking his uh, applause from the crowds and, and taking some vows there. And he made a speech which, after his death, became quite famous, reprinted uh, for school children to study. Right. What was the topic of his speech there? Putting the United States in a position of, of, of a world power, uh, promoting peace. Uh, some of those words, of course, are, are chisel and marble uh, inside our uh, McKinley uh, Monument tomb here in Canton. So uh, he recognized that we were a world player now. Well, let's listen in to some of the words the President had to say. Brief audio clip. Hey, fellow citizens, great statistics indicate that this country is in a state of unexampled prosperity. The figures show that we are furnishing profitable employment to the millions of working men throughout the United States. Our capacity to produce has developed so enormously and our products have so multiplied that the problem of more markets requires our urgent and immediate attention. By sensible trade arrangements, which will not interrupt our home production, we shall extend the outlet for our increasing surplus. What we produce beyond our domestic consumption must have vent abroad. Important to note that we've joined those together. There were, there were film uh, at the time without audio on it and some audio recordings. And there we've married the two so you can get a real sense of the president making his speech. Well, talk us through the events. There are all those people there. You said there was heightened security. How was the president assassinated? Well, the White House had received literally scores of warnings from uh, uh, embassies and officials overseas of the influx of anarchists who wanted to harm McKinley. McKinley, though, really felt that he would, nobody would really want to harm him. Uh, you know, he was mentioned before, he was a very decent man and very likable, very popular. 
and he couldn't imagine anybody wanted to kill him. But I think he, uh, George uh, Curtellu, his uh, secretary and others had warned him that uh, attempts might be made. But uh, uh, the, the visit to the Temple of Music where he was shot had twice been taken off the list by Curtellu, his secretary, and McKinley put it back on. Uh, what's ironic, Susan, is that uh, the, the assassin's timing uh, was just quite uh, ironic because he just happened to be in, in the first couple of, of front lines, front rows of people at the Temple of Music. They opened up the uh, side door to this building and the assassin was among uh, the first ones inside. The president he, had a very strict schedule, only 10 minutes or so to shake right, hands? Right, well, actually about uh, a little bit less than that. And uh, after about uh, five minutes of, of shaking hands, so that's when the uh, two shots uh, took place. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, again, there were many police and, and, and military people uh, and, and a couple Secret Service agents there, but they couldn't prevent it. And he fired point blank at the president. It was right in front point of him. Point blank, right? yes. And uh, what do we know about the, the bullets as they struck the president? Uh, I believe it was a 32 caliber pistol. The first bullet struck McKinley on the breastbone, but, he, but it hit a, a metal a button on his, uh, on his uh, suit and just glanced off. But it created quite a welt there. Uh, the other bullet uh, penetrated uh, uh, the front and rear walls of his stomach, uh, nicked off, I think, a little bit of, of the kidney, and, and uh, went into a muscle in, in his uh, back behind his stomach area. The president lingered for eight days. We're going to take some calls and then learn a little more about the details of his final days and his memorial services. Next telephone calls from Fitzgerald, Georgia. Susan, this is Massey McKinley, and I am a descendant of uh, President William McKinley. And I just wanted to call and tell you that uh, I just thank you and all the wonderful people at C-SPAN for the very insightful and educational programs that you conduct. Thank you. Where's your connection to the president, since he didn't have any direct descendants? Um, I am a fourth cousin, three times removed to the president. And naturally, I'm a collateral descendant because, as you mentioned, he had no direct descendants. You have a family story you can tell us about? Well, I wanted to ask uh, Mr. McElroy if he was aware that McKinley was descended from Duncan McDuff, who is of Shakespeare's fame. And yes. Ask him if he could elaborate on that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I didn't mention that in my book, but I'd come across that somewhere in the uh, genealogy. And uh, several members of the McKinley clan had been uh, warriors, uh, you know, in, in the fights in, on the English countryside uh, centuries ago. But uh, I was aware of that. Thank you. Next call is from Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, yes, I was wanting to ask the, uh, the gentleman, uh, Richard, uh, what. President McKinley's religious views and affiliation was? McKinley was a Methodist simply because he was raised in a Methodist household. Uh, the Bible was a very big part of uh, his uh, reading. Uh, his mother and father and sisters were all uh, abolitionists, uh, you know, promoting the idea of uh, freeing slaves. And uh, he uh, taught Sunday school in the Methodist church. Uh, he was very active in the Methodist church in Canton. Uh, here, and uh, I talked previously about him uh, courting Ida McKinley, who was a member of the Presbyterian Church. So he was a Methodist. He had a deep, abiding faith, uh, but he also had a, a touch of uh, fatalism, I think, in some of his uh, uh, some of his philosophies. I, I think deep down, McKinley thought that he might not make it uh, through his administration. He remarked to uh, Cortelyu, and and I think to one other uh, person in the White House, that uh, if he he preferred to, per, preferred to go like Lincoln did, with a bullet to the brain, uh, but he wanted to spare his wife any grief. And t that tells me uh, that I think maybe he possessed a sense of fatalism. I have another telephone number to give you, and this one's for teachers specifically. One of the real important reasons we're doing this series is to preserve it for use in the classrooms, and C-SPAN offers all of its video free of copyright restrictions so that you can teach in any way you'd like with it. Here's the telephone number for more information, 202-626-4858, 202-628-4858. Or you can find us on the internet at cspan.org backslash classroom. There are a number of teaching materials and a full kit just about this series that we will send out to you if you are a classroom teacher. We have about 15 minutes left, and uh, we've got more to, uh, to show you. The next is a piece of film from the time period, and it's, uh, about, it is depicting 
or is in fact, and there's debate over that, I'm going to come back to you, the execution of uh, the president's assassin. Uh, so watch carefully and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, Rich McElroy's theories on this. this well, this has been a big, uh, as you mentioned, Susan, a bit of controversy. I believe this is a reenactment. Uh, Thomas Edison, uh, back at the turn of the century, uh, had many recreations of, of events uh, that were in the news. And my belief is this is a recreation. Now, some people uh, remark that it looked like the assassin. Well, I think it's an actor who uh, looked like the assassin. Now, here they're testing the electric chair with, is, uh, with lights. Correct. And you'll see them uh, strap him in here. This is in uh, Auburn State Prison, state of New York. Strap him down, attach the electrodes, and, and give him the uh, 2,000, 3,000 volt uh, shot of electricity there. So uh, a lot of people feel that this is the original. I, I don't think it is. And we're going to watch this uh, until just before the bitter end here when the warden's hand comes down giving the signal for the electric current. I mentioned Shogaz was a drifter, unemployed. There they are strapping him in. And the warden will give the signal. How old was he when he fired the bullets into the president? I, I, it escapes me how old he was. He, I, I believe he was probably in his late 30s, uh, maybe and, even in, in his late 20s. And I'm, I'm not sure of his pounced age. upon by the people at the scene and uh, mobs kept uh, coming after him and they hoped to prevent any more violence to him. That's correct. Yeah, they had, uh, the police actually did a great job of protecting uh, Shogaz from the crowds. About 15 minutes left. Let's go to a call. Seattle is on the air. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes. If... Uh McKinley's assassination had taken place towards the end of his first term while there was no vice president to assume office. Who was the Speaker of the House that would have become president, and was he a Republican or a Democrat? Well, if that would be Thomas B. Reed. Reed was a uh, Republican, and uh, this would have created quite a constitutional crisis, uh, I think, and that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, Reed, of course, competed with McKinley for the nomination uh, for the White House for the race for presidency. So, uh, yeah, when, uh, when Garrett Hobart died, this created a problem, but uh, it was just a, a short time before uh, the uh, second convention in 1900. We have a call locally here from Canton. Welcome, you're on the air. Yes, um, I just have a comment. I was um, reading a book uh, quite a few years ago while I was in middle school. It called The Kennedy Brothers. And one of the things that it mentioned in it was the fact that a little girl by the name of Rose Fitzgerald was standing next to President McKinley the day that he was assassinated. And President McKinley had a lay of carnations, which was his favorite flower, and he handed that lay of carnations to Rose Fitzgerald, who later went on to become the mother of John Kennedy. And it just all seemed kind of ironic. Well, I don't know if it was Rose Kennedy. She may have been with uh, the president on the, on the uh, day he was assassinated, but there was a little girl by, I believe her name was uh, uh, Myrtle Ledger. She was from a, a small town in New York. McKinley had given this little girl his carnation, and of course he always wore it for a good luck sign. And uh, about a minute later, he was gunned down. So you, you cannot verify the Rose Fitzgerald story? No. For the caller? Well, speaking of Canton, Ohio, we're going to introduce you to someone else from Canton by telephone. Her name is Marilyn Von Allman, and she is an American history teacher at McKinley High School here in Canton, Ohio, to talk to us a little bit about how you teach when you have a famous son uh, who is part of the local history. Good morning. Hi. Can you tell us about how you use William McKinley in your classroom to teach your students about their own piece of history? Yes, I can. Um, I have a uh, course of study that I call uh, a natural link uh, from local to national history. And, of course, William McKinley being a uh, uh, favorite son of Canton, Ohio, uh, we use uh, him and uh, his politics and his lifestyle, very much a part of our uh, history. And we use the election of 1896 and, of course, his re-election in 1900. And we do analogies and comparisons to um, uh, journalism uh, then, called yellow journalism, of course, and the journalism of today, and, of course, the uh, technology of uh, the mass media. And what are students most often interested in? Uh, basically on what is written about them. 
uh, by journalists. Uh, they like to hear what um, not only the critics, uh, you know, their opponents uh, have to say, but uh, they find links as what is going on today in presidential campaigns, uh, local campaigns, uh, also regional campaigns. They, they become very interested in that. You're teaching about a period that is exactly 100 years from where we are now. Are you able to draw any parallels about the end of the century? Uh, great. Uh, in fact, in 1996, the presidential election, um, it was very big for uh, my class because I linked it with the 1896 presidential election. And my students uh, had to follow the campaign, of course, and then they linked it with the uh, William Jennings Bryan and William McKinley um, presidential campaign. And they watched the, uh, the results, the national results. And we uh, had a discussion on how they felt the media uh, presented it. And uh, it was quite an extraordinary uh, lesson. When uh, you're teaching about a president who was a teacher, uh, does that have any special significance for you? Of course, especially for McKinley High School, since basically he had two sisters that were teachers, and he taught for a while. As a matter of fact, McKinley High School was named after both William and his sister Anna McKinley. Anna had been a teacher and a principal in Canton City Schools for close to 30 years. His other uh, sister Helen taught in uh, Canton, but also in Cleveland. And... Um, this past May, I spoke at graduation, and I used William McKinley as my model as a parent, a teacher, and a citizen of Canton to draw connections for the graduating seniors. Richard McElroy has a question for you. Yeah, Marilyn, do you, f do you find that students are also very much interested in his assassination? It seems like these days uh, uh, kids are interested in the more macabre uh, side of uh, life. Uh, do they take an interest in that as well? Uh, they they do, but what they found was interesting, the reasons why uh, that he was assassinated and how really how close the assassin got to him. That, that interested them immensely. Of mm. course, the Secret Service of today and then are, you know, completely different, but that really fascinated them, that somebody could get that close to a president and the reasons why um, President McKinley was assassinated. And three Thank Secret you. Service agents with them at the time compared to the really dozens that we assigned to each president on, his, on their trips now. Marilyn Van Almond, thank you. Our goal with uh, talking with teachers is to give others uh, ideas on how they can teach history uh, using uh, our programming and also other artifacts of American history. So thank you for contributing to our conversation. Thank you very much. Marilyn Van Almond is here in Canton, Ohio at McKinley High School where she teaches American history. About 10 minutes left. Let's go back to calls. Tampa, Florida. Go ahead, Tampa. Hello there. How are you doing today? Just fine. fine. Thank you for the call. What's on your mind? Well, I am from Puerto Rico. What does that tell you? That you have a connection with President McKinley. Obviously, the War of 1898, the war that was fought ostensibly for the liberation of Cuba and Philippines and Puerto Rico, and for that matter, Guam and, uh, I don't know if another island too. How come Cuba and then Philippines were given independence, but Puerto Rico hasn't? How come Puerto Rico was denied the independence that was the reason why Puerto Ricans supported the Americans to begin with way back in the year, uh, in the year 1898? Well, independence, as you know, was slow in coming to a lot of the islands. Uh, McKinley uh, felt that they should be, uh, quote, Christianized and, and uh, educated to American ways. Uh, I don't think he realized uh, what opposition some of the uh, native populations and some of the citizens of, of Puerto Rico and the Philippines and Cuba, uh, some of those people resisted these measures. So. Uh, it was not uh, an easy process, and it was a complicated process. Uh, the Philippines, for example, had been promised independence uh, for many years and, and uh, didn't get it, of course, until, <coughs> excuse me, until later on in, in the 20th century. But uh, uh, yes, the 1898 war, uh, we, we uh, took over the control of uh, many island nations in the, in the Pacific and the Caribbean. Back to McKinley's assassination. He lingered for eight days. Where was he during that time? He was in the uh, house of Dr. John Milburn, who uh, was in charge of the ex exposition. 
uh, again. What do you think of the medical care he received? Well, pretty bad. First of all, the man who did the initial uh, surgery on McKinley at the infirmary in Buffalo uh, was an obstetrician. He'd, uh, we had an expert on treating gunshot wounds, uh, Susan, but he didn't arrive until after the, the first surgery had been performed on McKinley. So uh, that doctor didn't want to interfere with uh, uh, because, of, uh, uh, because of that. So he took him back to the Melbourne house where uh, uh, he appeared to be gaining health. And, uh, as it turned out, he was uh, suffering from uh, blood poison and gangrene. And uh, I think McKinley knew the end was near, especially after the first couple of days. How did Ida McKinley, who was, uh, we heard, really such a frail person throughout the presidency, take all this? Uh, she was very stoic, and I think she realized that her husband might not make it, especially after they shared a couple uh, uh, conversations. And uh, after McKinley's death, uh, 13 doctors uh, worked on him to do an autopsy and, and to find the exact cause of death and locate the bullet. And uh, after three hours of an autopsy, they, they couldn't find the bullet. So uh, the first lady asked them to uh, stop the autopsy. And uh, as you look at those sarcophagi today inside the McKinley uh, monument here, the, the bullet's still in McKinley. It was never located. Next call is from Sandusky, Ohio, and then some more vintage film. Sandusky, go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. I have two questions. Uh, was there an adversarial relationship between President McKinley and business leaders such as Hearst and Morgan and Carnegie and the DuPonts? And my second question is, is there any practice today in American life that's a legacy of President McKinley? Thank you. Well, I think there's a lot as far as legacies go with uh, ships and avenues and businesses and, and schools all named after him and uh, statues in probably a dozen states. So I think uh, he's left a, a, a strong legacy uh, as far as uh, remembering William McKinley. Uh, and your first question was? Uh, was about his relationship with the business leaders. I, I think McKinley didn't want to bite the hand that fed him. You know, the, the uh, strong, uh, the big businesses helped to elect him and provided money in his campaign. However, at the beginning of his second term in uh, 1901, he recognized uh, the abuses of the monopolies and the business trust. Uh, McKinley was a little bit upset with some of the, uh, the senators because they had stalled uh, probably five or six trade agreements that he had uh, had in the, in the House and the Senate, and uh, they pigeonholed those bills. Uh, and then he spoke out against the uh, abuse of power of some of these monopolies. So I think had you given him three or four more years, I think you would have seen a, a more vigorous pursuit of prosecuting some of the uh, business trusts. Overall, you've given him some pretty good reviews, but uh, what were some of his biggest mistakes or what things that he overlooked while in office? Well, again, I mentioned that uh, he, he probably could have taken a stronger role on, uh, on uh, civil rights, uh, but it was customary of, of most presidents back in those days to let the states or uh, private communities, uh, small communities and cities, uh, handle that uh, that problem. Uh, again, his his uh, McKinley's measure of success, I think, uh, is somewhat similar to Ronald Reagan in that McKinley didn't care who got credit for what, as long as it got done, as long as he was able to achieve something. Uh, there was enough glory to pass around to everybody. Uh, I, I feel that he didn't have a lot of uh, uh, failures as president. Uh, he was a caretaker president. He, you know, was, uh, although uh, not the same kind of leader Teddy Roosevelt was, certainly, uh, McKinley in his own way was a, was a forceful leader. I want to say thank you to Joyce Yet, who is uh, responsible for this whole facility here for her assistance in allowing us to bring our cameras here today and with the video we've uh, shown you. And let's uh, re return to some of that historic footage. Next you will see, and I'm going to ask uh, Richard McElroy to talk over it, uh, the first of the funeral processions, and this is from Washington, D.C. Well, as we can see here, it was a uh, pretty good downpouring. Uh, weather was not good. Uh, still a, a tremendous turnout of people uh, to view the president. Uh, there was an uh, open casket, uh, at least at some points uh, along uh, the funeral route. Uh, McKinley's uh, body, of course, uh, went by train to numerous cities. Uh, it was up in Albany, I but believe, New following York. Following the progression from Buffalo, did it come uh, to Washington first? Yes, yes. And so we're now seeing all the ceremonies in the capital city. That is for the correct. President. Did he lay in state in the? Yes. In the Capitol building. In the Capitol building, uh, in the White House. I'm sorry, in the White House. He came the 
the funeral train then came to Canton, Susan, where he was in the courthouse here. All right, we'll pick that up in a minute. We're still looking at scenes from Washington, D.C. And these are people lined up on the steps of the Capitol building. Yes. So he must have, his body must have been on view in the Capitol as yes, well. Yes, it was in the White House, I think, uh, maybe overnight, just for a brief period of time. And there's the president's casket being transported. Again, this is footage from 1901. Or citizens and now we are in, in arriving in Canton, Ohio. Yes. And uh, citizens were strewn just, you know, bouquets of flowers, of course, along the tracks. There was an honor guard here in Canton to meet him and uh, take him to a temporary vault uh, here at the West Lawn Cemetery in, in Canton, since there was no memorial, of course, uh, at the time. And the memorial where we are sitting today was, uh, was dedicated in 1907. So it took uh, a full six years for this to be built and then dedicated. Ida McKinley died just a couple of months before the dedication of the memorial. And there on the screen is the brand new president of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, paying his respects to the fallen leader, William McKinley. Huge crowds in Canton, of course. And let's return to telephone calls as we watch the final scenes. Buffalo, New York, go ahead. Yes, I was wondering if there is uh, any way Find out more information about the uh, the assassin of President McKinley, such as uh, books or anything that would have information on uh, his family tree. There's a memorial in Buffalo to the president, isn't there, sir? Sir, are you still there? Yes, I, I believe there is, um, and also uh, there is um, an exhibit at the Wilcox Mansion. Thank you. Uh, you. He wanted to know about the assassin. About the uh, books to read about the assassination. Yeah, I don't know if any books were ever written about the Shogaz himself, but uh, as I mentioned before, uh, H. Wayne Morgan's uh, uh, book and, and uh, uh, other books on McKinley have, have uh, traced his background. Uh, but I've, I'm not aware of any books on, on uh, Shogaz per se. We have some other thank yous to do. The local affiliate of C-SPAN here in Canton, Ohio is Time Warner, and our affiliates locally are a great assistance to us as we put together these presidential programs. We want to say thank you to them. Also wanted to tell you that all along the way as our programs have progressed, we have had uh, viewers who have joined us uh, locally and people who have been traveling along with us. I don't know if we can show the camera over here. We've got quite a crowd of people here this morning. But we have the full schedule here on the internet. And if you would like to join us for any of our other locations, uh, we will uh, we'll be able to uh, greet you uh, before and after the program and show you around a little bit. We are delighted to have you. I don't know if, Crystal, can you move your camera around to get the picture of this, or is this out of your shot? You cannot. Well, take my word for it. We've got a crowd of about 30 people here watching us today, this morning. Let's take uh, our last telephone call. Only three minutes left. It's from Manchester, Pennsylvania. Mr. McElroy, uh, the, cur the curator from the museum had showed the um, uh, the weapon that was used, or not the original. Uh, I believe you said it was a 32 caliber. Could you tell me if the original weapon that was used to assassinate McKinley is still in is part of American history, is archived in a museum, or has it disappeared? I, my belief is that it's in the uh, Erie County Museum in Buffalo, along with the uh, handkerchief and uh, one of the... Uh, uh, both spent cartridges and one of the, the bullets. I believe those are all up in Buffalo, if I'm not mistaken. As we wrap up here, 1901, the president assassinated Theodore Roosevelt, 43 years old, uh, with uh, just a few months of experience as vice president, becomes the new president. Set the stage for what kind of condition the country was in. Well, a different personality now occupies the White House, and uh, Roosevelt wants to send a world. Uh, a fleet on a world tour, the Great White Fleet, and uh, wants to show muscle, demonstrate uh, supreme confidence and, and energy, uh, a different kind of leadership, a different kind of style. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, I think his actions kind of overshadowed uh, many of the achievements that McKinley had, and uh, Americans uh, eventually forgot about William McKinley for the most part, Susan, because of this dynamic uh, personality now occupying the White House. And we, you talked earlier about McKinley as the front porch campaigner. Uh, did we see any more of it in American history? Well, I think uh, we, we saw a lot of people admire the techniques of McKinley, and uh, presidents uh, started campaigning by train more and more, uh, uh, you know, Truman and FDR and Eisenhower to a degree. But as far as the front porch campaigning goes, it, it's, it's uh, be a little bit impractical, I think, today to do that. But uh, there were other ideas in the 1896 uh, campaign, too, which uh, historians have uh, uh, remarked that 
could be used today, you know, for uh, campaign purposes. Some people drew, drew some parallels to George W. Bush, at least in the early part of his quest for the presidency. That's a bit of a stretch, I think. Uh, there are some similarities, but I, I think the candidates are vastly different in their backgrounds. Uh, but again, so there, you can borrow some ideas from uh, the McKinley campaign probably uh, to, to use today, but uh, the front porch campaign wouldn't be one of them. Thank you very much for being with us and Thank for you. all your time and expertise. Richard McElroy, who is a local historian, teaches in North Canton schools and is the author of seven books, including William McKinley and Our America. Our thanks, too, to Sam Bassbinder, who is author of The Architectural Symbolism of the McKinley Memorial, and to Jennifer Sowers and her colleagues here at the McKinley Museum. Thank you for being with us, and we appreciate your participation and the facts that you add to our American President's Life Stories series.